My name is Jeremy Cole, and for about five years, I worked as an accounting manager for one of the largest business firms in the country. My life for those five years was seemingly perfect. But little did I know that what would come after in the next few years would be far from that. In the year 2018, the firm I worked for decided to let employees go in an attempt to cut costs on salaries. Sadly, I was one of the employees let go. My life only went downhill from that point. Attempts at getting a new job seemed pointless at the time, but the pandemic that came in 2020 made an idea of getting a new job impossible. And in just three years, my wife had divorced me and taken the kids, leaving me with regular child support payments while unemployed. And suddenly, by 2021, I found myself in nearly crippling debt. I owed banks and family members huge sums of money, while at the same time being behind on almost all my bills. It was this situation that led me to make one single life-changing decision. A decision that could have gone horribly wrong. The date was November 13th, 2021. And as I said earlier, I was behind on a lot of payments. And so I decided I needed to find another way to make money and fast. I looked on the web for fast ways to earn large sums of money and was bombarded immediately with numerous sites advertising freelance jobs and how much I could earn from them. I ignored these sites as I had previously attempted freelancing during the quarantine. Now looking for something a lot more serious and promising. After scrolling for some time, I eventually found a site that wasn't necessarily what I was looking for, but intrigued me as it gave detailed examples and instructions on ancient rituals used to make money and fast. Now at the time, I wasn't the type to believe in rituals, spirits, or religion. But as the saying goes, Desperate times call for desperate measures. So I looked through the site till I found one relatively easy that seemed to be the answer to my problems. It was called The Man in the Fields. I began to read what the site had to say on the game. It is advised not to play this game. But to those who seek wealth and protection, engage at your own risk. If you indeed win this game, you will be granted financial and physical protection for an entire year. But if you lose, the consequences could be dire. To begin this game, you must summon the man in the fields. To do this, you will need to go into your backyard with a lantern and ask seven times, but who will scare the crows away? If you hear nothing after the seventh time, then the summoning failed and the game is over. But if you hear a voice say, that's not your biggest problem, then the game has now begun. At this point, the first thing you'll need to do is to go into your home and find a room with only one door. Put a crucifix in it and close everything in it that can be closed. This will be your safe haven. Once you leave this room, you will find that everything in your home that can be open will be open, and your job is to close all these items before the clock strikes 12. Throughout the ritual, as you close each item that is opened, you will see an eerie man dressed in farmer's overalls with a deathly complexion on his face. Ignore him, as he is not the man, but the herald, and not what you should fear. At no point should you look into your yard. If you do, you will see the elongated man in the fields, and he will see you. However, if this should happen, you will need to return to your safe haven immediately and remain there as the man in the fields will rush his way into your home in search of you. Close your eyes till the sun comes up, and this will end the game. Otherwise, you will be caught by the man in the fields, and pagan deities are unforgiving. But if you complete the task at hand without looking at the man, return to your room, and once the sun comes up, the man in the fields will reward you. I spent the next few days thinking over whether or not the game was a good idea. Despite my lack of belief in the supernatural, I wasn't too eager to summon a pagan deity after being warned not to. But then, one afternoon, I received a call from my ex-wife. Hello. I knew I hadn't paid child support for the past two months, but was surprised as she usually wasn't the one who called. Jeremy, I'm just calling you to give you a heads up. My lawyers and I filed a complaint against you, and we have a court date in January. You're going to receive the paper soon, but I simply felt I should be the one to tell you myself. Goodbye. She hung up immediately after that, and I slowly felt myself being filled with confusion and disappointment. 
Soon enough, I felt nothing but anger, and without any further hesitation, I knew what to do. I decided to play the game at my parents' house, as they barely stayed there on weekends and were the only people I knew personally who had a backyard. It started getting dark around 6 p.m., and I began looking for the room I would use as my safe haven. My childhood bedroom turned out to be the best option, as it was basically empty and barely had anything in it that would need to be closed. So I took my mom's crucifix and placed it in the center of the room before heading out to start the game. The time was 11 p.m., and it was now completely dark out. The thought of what I was about to do made the yard look scarier than it ever had, and despite having made up my mind on what I had to do, I could feel a lump form in my throat as I lit the candle and stepped into the yard. With every step I took deeper into the yard, I said the words, But who will scare the crows away? After the sixth time, I stood with my hands shaking slightly as I wondered if I should stop and walk back in. But I simply took a deep breath and said for the seventh time, But who will scare the crows away? The silence in the yard was almost deafening. I could feel my heart beating and after a while, not hearing anything, I blew the candle out and began walking towards the house, partly relieved. It was only then that I heard a voice that sent shivers down my spine say, that's not your biggest problem. My instinctive reaction was to turn and see who spoke, but luckily, I quickly remembered the rules of the game and kept walking to the house. It was impossible to not notice what had obviously changed about the house. All doors, drawers, shelves, and cans were open, and I immediately began to close them. With every door I closed, I made sure to not even mistakenly look outside. The kitchen took the longest as numerous cans, bottles, and pots were opened, but I carefully closed them all, one after the other. It was only as I closed the kettle I noticed the reflection of a man with a hat standing behind me. I began to shake as I put the lid back on the kettle, unsure of whether to turn to look at him. I decided to simply glance as I left the kitchen. The figure stood in the kitchen was dressed in farmer's clothes, and every part of him was gray and stained with what I assumed was dirt. He had no footsteps as he followed me slowly around the house while I continued the task. I remembered the sight said to ignore the being, but that wasn't easy in the slightest as I was completely scared and couldn't tell where the figure was most of the time. But eventually, I was done. I shut the last door and expected the figure following me to disappear, but it didn't. And soon enough, I began panicking as I wondered if I had carried out the wrong task. The being stood still and I decided to go rouse the house once more to ensure I had closed everything. But something was different this time as the being was no longer just silently following me and seemed closer every time I looked. My heart began pounding and I couldn't stop shaking. Suddenly, I noticed an empty open can in the kitchen sitting beside the sink and I hoped closing it would send the being away. I walked towards the sink, but as I picked up the can, it slipped and fell right out of my hands. At this point, I could feel the figure standing directly behind me, looking over my shoulder. I was fully focused on the being now, so I slowly picked up the can, but as I got back up, I was met by the window that sat over the sink and a clear view of the backyard. My heart stopped, and the figure disappeared as I stared at what I could only describe as a bunch of bones and sticks put together to look like a scarecrow. The scarecrow was about eight feet tall, with arms reaching the ground, and in place of its usual pumpkin head, was an inhuman skull. I stood frozen as I stared out the window. The man in the fields began to slowly come closer, and before I knew, he was running towards the house. I immediately dropped the can and began racing to my room upstairs. I could hear heavy footsteps behind me, but continued running, and right before closing the door, I got a good look at the creature I had summoned. I shut the door, and the house was filled with a piercing screech followed by claw sounds and bangs on the door. The clawing and screeching continued, and I simply cried, gripping the crucifix and praying for the sun to come up. This went on for hours, but eventually, all I heard was silence. I stayed in my childhood bedroom till 3 p.m. that day. The sun had been up for a while, but my fear didn't let me leave as the image of the man in the fields played over in my memory. In the month that followed, 
I had my parents admit me into a mental clinic as I kept seeing shadowy figures everywhere and was constantly waking up from nightmares. My court date came and passed and my absence resulted in my wife claiming the apartment I was living in and most of what little I had left, but I didn't care much. It's been two years now and no amount of time has been able to help me forget that night. I never see my family anymore and I barely get by with the job I have as a janitor. Things seem to be getting worse, but no matter how bad they get, I would warn everyone. Never suffer like a man in the fields. I have been working at Burger King for the past three years. I have two teenage daughters to look after and a mortgage to pay. But due to lack of high paying jobs, I am stuck working at this fast food restaurant chain for so many years, despite having a degree. Most of the time, this is not such a bad place to work, but there is a man who has made all our lives hell. Now, you must think this man is our manager. But surprisingly, our manager is a lady who is super nice and understanding. However, there is a regular customer who loves to harass us, especially the female staff members. His name is Mr. Beck, and he is the fattest man I have ever seen. Not that I'm fat phobic or anything, but this dude is a creep. I'll describe this guy so you can paint a picture. So, this dude is very fat. He always wears a three-piece suit with a tie and all. However, he cannot walk on his own, as his legs cannot take his body's weight. So, he uses an automated wheelchair that he can control with a control near his hands. He is bald and as pale as snow, and wears expensive shoes and watches. Everyone knows he is loaded, but instead of eating some good food, he prefers eating two burgers, large fries, and a large chocolate milkshake from Burger King. But that's not even the worst part. Because he is our regular customer, our manager expects us to give him special treatment. And in the beginning, we weren't against it. However, the more familiar he got with us, the worse he behaved. For example, we often reserve a table for him, or at least make sure the one nearest the exit is available for him. We also bring him his food. Whenever a waitress brings him his order, he tried to grope her or touch her inappropriately. He had pulled this stunt so many times that now only the male members of the staff served him. He also passed lewd comments at some of the younger girls. However, he never did it around our manager. So even if we complained about him, our manager used to ask us to adjust a bit. However, this one time, he crossed the line. As all the male waiters were busy, a new girl who had started working there had to bring him his food. Now, I myself have two daughters, and this girl was like a little sister to me. Hey, you look new here, gorgeous. Mr. Beck said to Myla, the new girl. Not knowing anything about this creep, the poor girl replied. Yeah, are you a regular here? Yeah, I am. Mr. Beck said with a mouthful of burgers and fries. Nice to meet you. Now I'll leave you to it. Mila pointed to his food, smiled, and started to walk away. But just then, the man wrapped his fat, chunky hand around Mila's waist and pulled her into his lap. Before the poor girl could make out what was happening, Mr. Beck goes, If you sit on my lap and feed me this food, I'll give you a hundred bucks. <laughs> then he started laughing like a maniac. Myla sat there frozen for a second, looking at us all behind the counter. Then she started struggling against his hole while the huge man laughed. All I could see was red. I instantly went over the counter and freed Myla from his grasp. The young waitress hugged me and started crying. You need to leave, sir, or else we will be forced to call the cops. Oh, you think you can get me arrested, miss? What are you, a mere waitress? You think you can get a man like me behind bars? I knew it was wrong to comment on someone's size, but this time I couldn't hold myself back. I had to give him a fighting comeback. Well, looking at you, I don't think you'd fit in a single jail cell. But I'm sure the cops could starve you enough to put you in one. This got the whole restaurant laughing. Everyone had seen what this man had done, and none of them were about to pity him. But I could see the rage in the man's eyes. He flipped his food tray, and in seconds, there were fries, pieces of bread, and chicken along with some spilled milkshake all over the floor and his table. 
You, you think you can humiliate, humiliate me, you, you bitch? Now Mr. Beck was yelling at me. In one instant, he tried to get up from his wheelchair, but the fat man couldn't take a single step and fell face first into the mess he himself had created mere minutes ago. This got another round of laughter from everyone. Even Milo was giggling. But before anything more could happen, there were cops in the Burger King, and after hearing about the incident, the cops helped the man into the chair and arrested him. More of the staff members stepped forward and complained about his harassment, and he was forever banned from Burger King. Now all the staff members were very relieved. Even our manager supported us after the shit that went down. After that day, we never saw the fat Mr. Beck in the Burger King again. It was like a hex was lifted from our restaurant. However, a few weeks later, someone anonymous started ordering the same order Mr. Beck used to order. This order was to be left at the door of a big mansion. None of the delivery boys saw who picked up the order, but every day in the evening around 5, the order used to be placed. Everyone was sure it was Mr. Beck, as he was, according to Daphne, one of our waitresses, addicted to junk food. But we didn't care much, as no one had to deal with the fat man anymore. However, one day, when the delivery boy delivered the order, which we thought to be Mr. Beck's, he returned and told us that the food he delivered yesterday was still by the door, which meant Mr. Beck had not eaten his order. Or he must have forgotten it. Some of the staff members even joked that the fat lad must have croaked with all the eating he does. We all laughed it off. But the next day, the delivery boy said that the food from the last two days was still by the door. This got us a bit concerned. However, if he was indeed dead, then who was making the phone call to order the food every day? We all hated the man a lot, so we did not think much of it that evening as well. But when the delivery boy reported the same thing the next day, our manager decided to call the cops and report the incident. Initially, the cops did not think it was serious either, because we were receiving the payment for each order on our online payment portal. But when this continued for five consecutive days, we requested the cops to take a look. Just to be sure everything was okay, I and my manager decided to go to the mansion while the cops checked it out. One of the cops decided to check through the windows when the owner of the mansion, whom we thought was Mr. Beck, did not answer the door. As soon as he peeked inside through the glass, he yelled for backup. Soon, there was a bunch of cops and paramedics breaking into the mansion, all while I and our manager were standing there clueless. Oh yeah, this is his mansion. His full name is Mr. Lambert Beckham. And didn't anyone tell you what's going on? No, officer. Well, looks like this dude died of a stroke weeks ago. Plus, he kind of choked on a fry, could not get to his milkshake, and due to the fear of choking, died of a stroke, and finally dies. But that's not even the worst part. There are like a dozen cats of multiple breeds in there, and he wasn't able to feed them for a week. These felines ate half the dead man. The medics will take whatever is left of his body. Looks like the cats didn't starve themselves and didn't mind eating their owner. Saying that, the officer left, and I and our manager just waited there not knowing what to do. A few minutes later, there was a strong rotten stench in the air, and then we spotted the medics carry some remains of what looked like a half-eaten Mr. Beck on a stretcher. I kid you not, that was the worst thing I had ever seen in my 35 years of life. Looked like the man got what he deserved after all. Although it is quite well known here, in the rest of the world, there are very few franchises. And in fact, no one talks about them as much as you might think. I'm a big Hortons fan. There is nothing nicer than the smell of good coffee in the morning. But as you can imagine, this is not a story about how much I love coffee. This is a story of the worst day of my life, and yet, I am thankful for it, because by a miracle, it was not the last. It all started when I turned 18. Right out of high school, I needed a part-time job to pay for college, and Hortons was my first choice. The people at the cafeteria already knew me. I was always going with my father, and I lived a few blocks away, so they hired me almost without hesitation. My first few months were very good. 
Everyone told me I was too dedicated for a simple coffee shop, but what was wrong with that? I enjoyed it. Everything was going great until one Tuesday in winter. I remember it was a cold, rainy morning. Our place was a bit small, so there were very few people attending it, especially in the morning. We had no security personnel, but we could call the police if something happened. But the place was very quiet, generally. That Tuesday, it was very quiet. There were very few people in the place. One man stood out among them. He was very tall and muscular, but for some reason, he looked absolutely terrified. He was looking everywhere without stopping, and he was already on his third cup of coffee. I wanted to ask him what was wrong, but I didn't want to be too intrusive. Anyway, the answer came on its own. Some men entered the place. Two of them were in suits and were very tall, even taller than the one sitting at the table. Behind them was another man with a cigar, much fatter and shorter than the rest, but nevertheless, he was the most terrifying of them all. The other men looked quiet, but the shortest one, who looked like the boss, had all the appearance of a mobster. As soon as they walked in, I was cleaning up near them and said hello. But not only did they ignore me, but I could see how the boss made a face at one of them in the suit, mocking me, and he chuckled under his breath. The men walked straight over to where the muscular man sat, and as one of the men in the suit grabbed him by the shirt, the boss said something I couldn't hear. In response to this, the muscular man started to cry, but the only thing he managed to do was to get the boss to throw the boiling coffee in his face. The man fell to the floor and began to scream, and the few customers that were there began to leave Horton's. I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't take any more of this. So with my broomstick, I put myself in the middle of the boss and the victim, threatening them and telling them I would call the police. <laughs> Aren't you a bold one? After saying those words, the man motioned to the men in suits and the three left. After that, I and other employees called the police and took care of the victim in the back. The man didn't tell us much, but he was clearly terrified. My boss stayed with him in the main office and asked me to go take the trash out back. He would take care of everything. Much calmer, I gathered up the trash and went to the back. What I didn't know was that as soon as I opened the door, there were people waiting for me. The mafia man was in the rain with his two bodyguards who grabbed my arms and pulled me towards him. I struggled to escape, but when I tried to open the door, it was locked. What? Come on, kid. Do you think it was a coincidence that I knew you'd be taking out the trash? Before I knew it, the man had stepped behind me and with one violent movement, grabbed me by the hair and threw me to the ground. You see, kid, I could have left. In fact, I was about to leave. But you know what? I remembered something. I don't like boldness. I tried to crawl away, but one of the men grabbed me by the hair and dragged me into a small garden where we had some plants. I felt helpless. Please, don't be angry with me. I only wanted to defend the poor person. You threw hot coffee on him. Oh boy, don't cry. I think you misinterpreted the situation. I am not angry with you. You're not? Of course not. I don't get mad at anybody. I pay people to do that for me. The man snapped his fingers and immediately the other one of the men stepped on my head in the mud. The ground was wet from the rain, and my head was sinking as the man stepped on it and moved his foot as if he wanted to squeeze a cockroach. My head was sinking deeper and deeper. I could hardly breathe and I was swallowing a lot of dirt. I could feel a worm walking on my face. Luckily, I got to a part where the dirt was dry and the man stopped. I stuck my head out quickly to breathe and immediately received a punch in the face from the boss. Not gonna lie, sometimes I do get a little angry. <laughs> Suddenly, the man pulled out a gun and pointed it at my head. Well, kid, I had fun, but you have to go. Boss, there's people watching us. This is a kid. Maybe we're crossing the line. Angrily, the boss put the gun away and laughed. See, I told you guys you should talk a little more. Both of you are actually right. Sorry, kid. I have some anger issues. I'm treating them with a psychologist. The men walked away from me. 
walking slowly, almost disinterested. Hey, kid, tell your boss I'll expect him for dinner on Friday. Tell him I'll bring him some nice wine. Confused, I stood in the rain crying, not believing I was alive. The police came for me, and I warned them that the three men were escaping. The officers ignored me and told me to drop the subject. That was the last time I visited Horton. Soon after, I moved in with the help of my family. After that, I was terrified for years. Years afraid that this man would come to kill me for no reason. But it never happened. Several years later, I found out that I was incarcerated while doing an interview. I swear that prison had more luxuries than my house. Life is sometimes very unfair, but I am thankful to be alive. I am thankful to smell the coffee every morning and not to have died that terrifying rainy day. Hello, my name is Lindsay. You could say I'm one of those pioneers in urban explorations, although no one ever really gave me credit for that. My YouTube channel was always specialized in horror stuff, and at the time, I was pretty well known. But after what I experienced that night, I decided to delete my channel and be forgotten forever. My story began at the height of urban legends and creepypastas. At that time, all you could see of horror on YouTube were gameplays of popular content creators playing games like Amnesia or Slenderman. I was never good at games, but I loved horror, and I was ready to go further. I started doing urban exploration. I had already gone to some cemeteries with friends when I was younger, but I had never done anything like this for YouTube, although I didn't think it would be much different. There were already some other YouTubers. I can't say I was the first one to do it, but I realized that this was something new and that sooner or later I would explode and I would be one of the first. I started with some cemeteries and abandoned places. My audience, who were used to me uploading crime investigation videos, reacted very well and wanted more content. Soon after, I upped the ante and started looking for ghosts more aggressively, like playing Ouija or summoning the ghost of Bloody Mary, but none of that worked, until I decided to film myself playing the elevator game. To play the elevator game, I had to follow a set of rules, but if part of the challenge I would do, I could only see the rules on the spot. To start the game, I went to a luxurious hotel with more than 10 elevators, as this was the condition to be able to play the game. I put a camera in my shirt pocket so I could capture whatever happened, even though I knew nothing would happen for sure. I started by taking the elevator to the second floor. Then I pushed the button for the fourth floor, and from there I went back to the second floor. Following the rules, I went to the sixth floor, back to the second floor, and from there I went to the tenth floor. From that floor, I went back to floor five. I was about to see the rules again, but on that floor, something strange happened. A very strange looking woman got on the elevator with me. The woman was very tall. Her face was elongated and deformed. Possibly, she had some kind of disease. Her clothes looked old fashioned as if they were from several years ago. But what struck me the most about her were her eyes. They were red. Was she wearing contact lenses? Before I could see the rules again, the elevator started moving again, and she went up to the 10th floor. Even though I had filmed all this time, the game was ruined by the strange woman getting on the elevator, as I couldn't keep going from one floor to another with another person next to me. Besides, this woman was really very strange and gave me a bad feeling. With her on camera, I'm sure I'd have good content for YouTube by now. I was getting off the elevator, but to my surprise, the woman spoke to me. Where are you going? What do you mean? My room is on this floor. As soon as I told that lie, something surprised me. The elevator doors closed by themselves with me inside. Without anyone touching it, the elevator started to go down to the second floor. The woman didn't answer me. She just stared at me in a terrifying and intimidating way. To avoid the awkward silence, I grabbed my cell phone and looked at the rules, just to make the time pass faster. When I saw the rules, I froze. The rules said that on the fifth floor, a woman I had to ignore would get on the elevator, and on the tenth floor, she would ask me where I was going. The rules said whatever it took, I had to ignore her. 
I swear, I can't tell you the horror I felt in my whole body. It was as if a current of fear and pain ran through me from head to toe. As I read the rules, I could feel this woman's gaze scanning me up and down. I could hear a giggling coming from behind me. We both knew we hadn't followed the rules. <laughs> the laughter was getting louder and louder, but immediately I began to feel something very strange. The laughter wasn't coming from behind me anymore. It was coming from my own head. <laughs> the laughter sounded louder and louder and louder and louder from inside my head. The elevator reached the first floor, and when the doors opened, I escaped as fast as I could. The pain in my head was too strong, and the voice kept ringing and never seemed to stop. Dizzy and full of pain, I fell to the floor, and suddenly I felt something pull my leg with enormous violence. It was the woman from the elevator. When I could see her, something in her had changed. She no longer had eyes, nose, ears, or anything. She only had a huge mouth that covered her whole face. The woman dragged me back into the elevator with enormous violence, and when she had me there, she did nothing. The silence was absolute. It was as if she had left. Only she didn't, because I could hear her breathing behind me. That's not all. From her mouth, I could feel hot saliva dripping down the back of my neck. The woman was behind me, but she chose not to attack me. This was not a wild animal. This was a thinking being. Very sadistic thinking being. The elevator doors closed with me inside and it began to rise. As it did, I could feel the woman's breath behind me. Closer and closer to my neck. All I could do was tear up and hope that someone would find my camera. Hope that no one else would make this mistake that I made and not tempt unknown forces. When the woman was behind me, the elevator arrived at its destination. I listened as the woman opened her mouth. She was about to die. So I closed my eyes and cried harder than ever. Are you all right, young lady? When I opened my eyes, there was a man behind me. This was a normal man and he was looking at me in a confused manner. I turned around and the woman was gone. The man must have asked for the elevator and broken up the game. This man unknowingly saved my life. When I contacted the police, they looked at the tape of the hotel, but there was nothing. According to it, I was alone all this time, but there was one thing that the face I could detect. In it, you can see somehow, someone invisible grabbed my feet, proving that something weird had really happened. Do you want to know another curious thing? Once I took the camera out of my shirt, I noticed that it was empty. I had never recorded anything, although I was sure I had initiated the recording. As much as I investigated, I discovered that this woman was surely from another dimension, and I had called her while playing the elevator game. Possibly, that was the reason no camera could detect her. A few days later, I deleted all my ideas from YouTube, and although they say that the files are always left on the internet, I must admit that this worked for me. Eventually. People stopped talking about me, and years later, everyone had already forgotten about me. It cost me a lot to do this, but if anyone had seen the leaked hope for as long as I can remember, I've always been a big fan of the occult. I love paranormal stories. I watched all the horror movies you can imagine, and obviously, I even opened my own YouTube channel. Nowadays, I have to admit that I'm a bit removed from horror. I used to think Nothing was scarier than the paranormal, the occult. Ghosts and ghouls seemed genuinely terrifying to me, and nothing could be worse than having a ghost haunting your family. Until one night, I realized how wrong I was. That night, I realized that reality trumps fiction. That night, I realized that I didn't have to be afraid of ghosts. I had to be afraid of people who are still alive. It all started one cold Friday morning. Halloween was a month away, but even so, I wanted to go ahead and order my costume. I didn't have a lot of money on me, so I wanted to do something simple, so I chose to dress up as Freddy Krueger. All I needed was a pullover, black jeans, a hat like his, and some hands with blades. I had thought of all the places to shop, so I chose everything on Craigslist. 
and ordered it. When the order arrived, I was overjoyed. I would have a perfect costume for very little money. My wife is a special effects makeup artist, so I could make myself look a lot like Freddy. I went out to get my stuff, not knowing what I was about to find. The Craigslist delivery man was a normal man. No feature of his face was striking. His hairstyle was nothing special, and his physical build was unremarkable. Nothing about him was remarkable. So why he scared me so much was inexplicable. It was as if something around him gave him a bad feeling. As if a terrifying aura surrounded him. Trying to ignore my feeling, I went to get my things, and he spoke to me. You having a costume party, aren't you? As he said this, his face changed completely. The man flashed a huge grin from ear to ear. As he did so, all his facial features hardened. His eyes were still the same, but his gaze had changed. It was piercing and intimidating. He may have just asked me a simple question, but the words pierced my ears like blades. How, uh, how do you know? Without answering me, he looked at the bag in the direction of Freddy's glove. <laughs> oh, of course, silly me. I am preparing in advance my Halloween costume, that's all. You know, my friends and I like Halloween very much. We usually dress up as clowns. That is cool. Although for us, Halloween is all year round. Someday, I'll show you my costume. I'm sure you'll be delighted. Yes, someday. Uh, have a nice day. The man didn't answer me. He just kept staring at me with his huge smile. As I opened the door to my house, I could see him slowly raise his hand and waving it back and forth. He waved at me. I locked myself in the house and looked out the window. But when I did, he was gone. Uncomfortable, I showed my wife the things and she was happy. I let her joy rub off on me and pretended nothing had happened. I let this encounter pass as something rare, something that would never happen again. Little did I know that was far from over. A few nights later, my wife had left with her friends, so I was going to spend the night alone with my four-year-old son. I was sitting there watching a horror movie when suddenly I heard a car pull up to my house. I thought my wife had arrived early, so I looked at the ring camera, and there it was. A scary man dressed as a clown was walking slowly towards my house, making strange head movements and staring at my camera as he walked. This man was the Craigslist driver. The man quickly arrived at my house and immediately rang the doorbell over and over again as his ghoulish grin grew bigger and bigger. He knew I was home. He knew that each ring scared me more than the last in desperation, I called the police and told them to come urgently, that there was a scary man dressed as a clown at my door. They told me to stay on the line, but I cut the phone to get my son who was in his room. Before I went, I looked again at the ring camera, and the clown was no longer there. I couldn't believe it. The man dressed as a clown had broken into my house. I didn't even try to fight. My only reaction was to go upstairs and into my son's room. The man on Craigslist may have caught up with me, but he didn't even try to chase me. He just followed me in slow motion, enjoying every step I took up the stairs. After covering the door with a piece of furniture, I locked myself in the room and hugged my son. The clown started banging violently on the door while laughing frenetically. My son and I stood hugging each other, crying. He didn't know what was happening, but he knew it was something bad. Suddenly, the banging stopped and I saw something slide under the door. It was a picture of my son sleeping through the night. There were also other pictures of me and my wife sleeping. The man had been in my house before. We just didn't know it. My blood froze and I didn't know how to react. I was stunned. After that silence, I heard several footsteps in my house until those footsteps came into the room. It was the police. The policeman who came told us that they did not see anyone in the house. When they arrived, it was already empty. After watching my ring camera video, they told me that they had seen this clown in other films. Like other clowns, these people were harassing people. As a result of this, there were several disappearances and crimes. 
They were never able to identify the clown, and when I told them it was the same man from Craigslist, they were able to identify him, but never found him. Apparently, that was his last delivery. The next day, I changed all the locks, and within a year, I moved out. No matter how safe my house seemed, I could no longer live there knowing that my wife and son were in danger. From that day on, I could no longer watch horror movies, especially those with clowns in them. Maybe one day I will recover from what we experienced, but for now, I prefer to watch comedy movies. Urban legends and myths have always been something my friends and I used to have a lot of fun with while growing up. We would occasionally scare or prank each other, but apart from this childish interest, we never really took any steps to find out if these myths were real or not. That was until our last week in high school when we decided it was time to take the next step. My friend Jason and I had watched a couple of YouTube videos where people played games summoning myths and demons. From Charlie Charlie to Bloody Mary, the idea of encountering a supernatural being or spirit intrigued us and left us asking if these myths were truly myths or actual reality. A question that would eventually leave us all wishing we never asked. It was our last week of high school, and while most people our age were out partying and planning, I decided what my friends and I needed to do together before leaving for college was something we'd always wanted to do. My parents were out of town that week, so I figured there was no better time. I got on my computer and looked up some of the most popular urban myths to summon, but most instructions were either unclear or too complicated to carry out in my home. Eventually, I found a site that had listed numerous urban legends, stories, and instructions on how to summon, although warning against it. I spent a while on the site till I eventually found a game I had never heard of. One man hide and seek. The next day I told my friends about the plan. Sophie was skeptical at first, but Jason and I helped her relax and I told them to come over later that day so I could explain the rules and what I would need from each of them. Okay guys, this is called One Man Hide and Seek and the rules of the game are simple. I continued. First, we need a doll that doesn't look human but has limbs. So Sophie, I think one of your rag dolls as a kid should work. Next, we cut the dowel open with a needle, removing its stuffing and filling it with rice. I was interrupted by Jason saying, Sorry, did you say rice? I replied, Yes, the rice attracts the demon. Then we clip our nails and put them in with the rice. We aren't supposed to put the nails of other people or else they might get hurt. After that, we take a piece of red thread and sew the dowel back up without cutting off the extra length. Instead, we take the extra length and tie it around the dowel before tying the two ends together. Um, the site said this represents the dowel's blood vessels and traps the spirit into the dowel? I was interrupted again by Sophie and Jason laughing, but I couldn't understand why they found it a bit funny, so I continued reading the instructions. We filled the bathtub with water and put the dowel in there to separate the spirit world from the real world. Then we find a room with a TV to hide in. So I was thinking the living room. We purify the room we're hiding in. Jason, your mom still has those instant candles she uses for yoga, right? Jason simply nodded and I continued. We'll place a cup of salt water and the needle in the room. Then we give the doll a name. Not ours and not anyone we know. Jason raised his hand before saying, Lucia. Sophie and I didn't seem to have any issues with the name, so I continued giving instructions. It was getting a bit late now, so I decided to hurry up. After that, we turn off all the lights and devices apart from the TV. Then we say to the doll three times, we are the first it. Then we run to the room, turn on the TV, and stay as quiet as possible. Sophie then said, hold on, why does the TV have to be on and what happens if we aren't quiet enough? Are you scared? He said, laughing. I responded with, The room went silent for a while, but I continued. We close our eyes and count to ten. Once we're done, we get the needle, go back to the bathtub, and say to the doll, We have found you, Lucia. Then we cut the thread, binding the doll, and say three times, Lucia, you are the next it. Return the doll to the tub and hide in the room. We remain as silent as possible, fill our mouths with salt water, and search for Lucia. Most times, it remains in the bathroom, so no need to worry. 
When we find the doll, we spray the salt water from our mouths on its face and say, we have found you. Then we burn the doll and discard its remains. I looked up to see a worried look on Sophie's face, and she eventually said, So what happens if it's not in the bathroom and we can't find it? I didn't have an answer to that, so I responded with, The site doesn't say anything about that, but that's why we have to keep the salt water on us as protection. That's it. The concern on their faces became more obvious, and a part of me began to think, Maybe it wasn't such a good idea. But I brushed the feeling off, and they simply went home agreeing to be back at mine by midnight. Sophie returned around 11 p.m., as she said. She didn't want to be out on the streets by midnight, while Jason, on the other hand, didn't arrive until 1 in the morning. I wasn't sure we had enough time to set up, as the game had to be played at exactly 3 a.m. But immediately, Jason arrived, we had it all set up in around 30 minutes. The rag doll Sophie had gotten was green and was also missing one of its button eyes, but we didn't think that would be a problem as the doll didn't look human at all, and that was all that mattered. Eventually, it was almost 3 a.m., and it seemed Jason had gotten over his paranoia if he had any, as no one was more excited than him to play the game. At around 2.58 a.m., we turned the lights off, turned on the TV, and before we knew it, it was time. We all walked into the bathroom, and the sight of a floating rag doll in a bathtub filled with water wasn't as creepy as I thought it would be. Jason walked up to Lucia, picked her up, and said, Jason, Sophie, and Mark are the first it. Jason, Sophie, and Mark are the first it. Jason, Sophie, and Mark are the first it. He returned the doll to the tub, and we all moved back to the living room. Nothing out of the ordinary was happening, so we closed our eyes and began counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Before I could say ten, I heard a thud, followed by a light scream. So I immediately opened my eyes to see Jason holding on to Sophie and laughing. We stayed laughing for a while before eventually deciding to finish the game. I returned to the bathroom to see the doll still floating in the tub. At this point, I was feeling more comfortable now, so I picked up the doll and cut the thread with the needle before saying, We have found you. You are the next it, Lucia. It was only as I said those words, I realized something strange. Despite being submerged in water for a while now, the doll in my hand was nowhere near wet. In fact, it almost felt completely dry. I returned the doll to the tub and we immediately went back to the living room to the living room and filled our mouths with salt water. After waiting for a while, once again, nothing strange happened and I could see relief on Sophie's face. At this point, I decided it was time to finally end the game, but as we began walking towards the bathroom, Jason spat the water from his mouth and said, <laughs> This was fun, guys, but it was obviously all a load of crap. I opened the door once again, expecting to see the funny sight of a rag doll floating in my tub for the third time that night. But all I felt that instant were chills run down my spine. Literally. The bathroom was eerily cold, and I could almost hear my heartbeat as I was met by the sight of the bathtub filled with nothing but completely still water. What the hell? Jason said. But before he could say more, we heard a loud sound come from the living room. We slowly walked back into the living room to see the TV randomly changing channels from one to another before eventually losing audio and then switching off, plunging the room into darkness. I immediately rushed to turn on the lights. A look of fear was all over Sophie and Jason's face and I couldn't help but wonder if I had made a terrible mistake making them play the game. Guys. Let's just calm down, find the doll, and spray the salt water on its face. As long as we stay together, we should be fine. Sophie responded with, Why can't we just leave and go home? I could tell she was completely bothered now, so I replied calmly. The site warned us against leaving because our nails are in the doll. It won't just let us go on with our lives, so relax. Come on, let's just find the doll. We looked around the house for about an hour. All the while, hearing loud thuds and sounds that didn't seem normal to anyone. 
The phones had lost all signal and leaving the house wasn't an option. The longer we took, the more things we began to hear. And eventually, we could hear what seemed like laughter coming from all around the house. It was a deep laugh and we couldn't tell exactly which direction it was coming from. That was until the voice finally spoke. Mark, Sophie, Jason, if what you seek is to return me to my realm, then come find me upstairs. But I warn you, I will not return alone. A soul must come back with me. The voice was strangely deep, and the house felt extremely cold now. What does that mean? Sophie said. Jason responded with, You know what it means. They looked at me as if asking what next to do, but I was completely scared now, and I could tell they were too. Let's go find it. Here. I said, handing them the glass of salt water. No matter what, don't let the salt water out of your mouths, and let's stay together. Immediately, we walked upstairs. We could feel the temperature drop, and more laughter filled the house. Only this time, it was obviously coming from my parents' room. Jason began walking towards the room while we followed behind, and as we arrived at the door, everything went completely silent. Jason slowly pushed the door open, but before we could walk in, he was pulled in, and the door slammed behind him. I immediately began banging on the door, but it was as if someone was holding it firmly in place. I kept kicking and kicking till eventually it broke, and I walked into the horrific sight of Lucia seated on Jason. His hands appeared to be pinned to the floor, and although Lucia's hands weren't even close to Jason, huge claw-like marks were all over his chest. I stood frozen, looking at the horrific scene of my best friend Jason being mutilated by a doll. The doll abruptly paused and looked at me for a second. I could almost see a smile on his face, but before I could react, it was immediately covered in salt water from Sophie's mouth. Later that night, I burnt the doll and discarded its remains. The phone started working not long after the doll was burnt, and Sophie quickly called an ambulance. Jason survived the encounter, and no matter how many times we tried to explain the situation, there was no way the police were going to be convinced what we were saying was actually the truth. The police tried for months to make sense of the case, as the marks on Jason didn't seem human at all, and his story correlated with ours, but eventually they closed the case, stating we had been under the influence and Jason was probably attacked by an animal that night. A conclusion I could only wish was true. After that night, our curiosity for urban myths and legends completely faded, and sadly, so did our friendship. I am a father now, and I still spend hours wondering why the demon left Jason alive. The sleepless nights are less now, but I'll never forgive myself for putting their lives in danger, all in the name of an urban myth. Despite my experience, I wouldn't tell you all urban myths have some truth behind them, but I know for a fact that you should never play the game. One man, hide and seek. It is said that people who drive trucks or buses on the road have the best horror stories to tell. And you know what? It's true. I may not have been on top of any vehicle when this happened to me, but the fact that I was on foot, running, made it much worse because I had no way to escape. This happened to me in Argentina, the country where I was born. When I had not yet gone to try my luck in Europe, I lived in the rural part of the country. There, we have different traditions and urban legends, but I always ignore them. I thought they were just stories that our parents told us to scare us. At that time, I was already a father, and I didn't really believe in any of that. My wife and I had recently separated, but my son Al's mother was traveling in Europe, and so that he wouldn't fall behind in school, we decided to have him stay with me for a while. I knew that the adaptation was not going to be easy, so I tried to get us to do activities together. And when everything failed, the only thing left was what I liked to do the most. Go for a run on the road. In the beginning, I held back, tried not to go too far from our house, and come back as soon as he got tired. But as my son gained more endurance and perseverance, he was also encouraged to run farther. Al was a 17-year-old teenager, so sooner or later, he was going to catch up to my pace. One night, maybe we went a little too far. We had never run that part of the road before. 
All the times I had been out that way were by car. The place looked a lot shadier and lonelier at night, but I liked it. It had a strange sense of peace. We kept running with our eyes closed, enjoying the night, until a strong blue glow pierced my eyelids and forced me to open my eyes. To my surprise, the light was not coming from the desolate road, but from the pasture. Curiosity got the better of me, and I approached. I had never seen such a glow. What could it be? It even had something hypnotic about it. As I walked slowly to the grassland, I could see how the light became brighter and brighter. At that moment, I was in such a trance-like state that I had forgotten that owl was behind me. My eyes burned just looking in that direction. It was like a small sun directly attacking my eyes, drawing me to him. As I reached the middle of the pasture, I encountered the source of the glow for the first time. It wasn't a person with a flashlight, and there was nothing or no one generating the light. She was just there on her own, floating. I was going to keep getting closer until almost by reflex, I turned around and saw Al, just as confused as I was walking towards that light. A strange sense of alertness came over me and I ran to my son, shaking him to get him to react. Once he did, we tried to run back to the road, but it was impossible. I felt very dizzy and with every step I took, I stumbled or fell. My legs and body felt very weak and each step I took to escape was harder than the last. I started to cry and felt the need to vomit, but I knew that the only concern, the only thing I had to be thinking about at that moment was to escape. During that period of panic, I remembered all the urban legends my parents and grandparents told me. I knew what was happening, but I refused to admit it. The bright, intense light had a name. That was the evil light. Do you know what else I knew about this legend? That no one who had seen it up close had survived to tell the tale. I fell once more to the ground, and as I looked ahead, the bright blue light was in front of me. It moved very slowly but for every inch it advanced, I felt worse. And it was even harder to escape. When it was in front of me, all I could do was scream in despair. Suddenly, I felt someone grabbing my shoulder, dragging me along. It was Al. The teenager pulled me far enough to get some distance. With his help, I managed to stand up and run towards the road without falling. And when we finally arrived, another light approached us at high speed. Surrendering to what was coming, we both closed our eyes, not knowing what was about to happen to us. When I opened my eyes, I realized that the last light was a car, and it almost ran us over. A man got out of the car angrily, yelling at us, but I couldn't concentrate at all on what he was saying. Behind him, in the distance, I could see the light coming closer and closer. As soon as we saw it, Al ran as fast as he could. I wanted to warn him to get out of there. But there was no point. I felt I could only run with my son. The man forgot about us, and with a lot of curiosity, walked towards the light. The man walked through the huge orb of light, losing himself in the brightness. Once he finished walking, he had already disappeared as if he had never been there. Meanwhile, I could only run to my house. I ran and ran until there was no sign of anything. Not the car, not the man, not the light. We had escaped. The police went to that area and did not find the mysterious light, but they did find the car. That same day, the man driving the car was reported missing. The police questioned us to find out what had happened and were shocked that Al and I had the exact same story. Even though they told us they couldn't take a report from a La Luz Mala as official, they believed us. Everyone believed us. Our family, the police, and the whole town. This story may sound crazy, but if you live long enough in this area, you will believe me too. Today, I've settled with my wife and I have a very good relationship with Al. He may be getting on with his adult life, but he visits us all the time. No matter how far apart we are at the time, he always knew that I was his father. And just as I love him, he loves me and he would never let anything happen to me. Sometimes I see on the internet the news that happens in my old town, and I am noticing that the signature of the evil light are becoming more and more frequent. The only thing that hasn't changed is the fact that no one who has seen it up close 
has survived long enough to tell the tale. I guess we are the only ones who have survived something so dangerous. And from what I see, this is not going to be changing anytime soon. I rang the bell twice and waited for someone to answer the door. I was standing in the front porch of the Parsons family home. They were relatively new to the neighborhood and had moved into the locality only two months back. They looked friendly enough during my brief interactions with them and came across as generally nice people. You know, the typical suburban American family. So I was not surprised when Mrs. Parsons reached out to me and inquired if I would be willing to babysit her son for an evening. They were offering $100 for it. That is good money for a 15-year-old in my neck of the woods, so it didn't take me long to say yes. Although I did hear from somewhere that the boy was a bit of a problem child, and I had never babysat any male kid before. Come on, he's just a little kid, how hard could it be? I thought to myself. Well, I was going to find out soon anyway. The door opened and I was greeted by Mr. and Mrs. Parsons. They invited me into their home and introduced me to their eight-year-old son, Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. I'm Kathy. Nice to meet you, I said as I shook his hand. He smiled sheepishly at me and then went back and sat on his sofa. He started playing a game in his video game console. Mrs. Parsons then told me that she and her husband would be attending a concert in the evening. She promised that they would be back by 10 p.m. and her husband would drop me home when they got back. She had already cooked for Jimmy and asked me to reheat it in the microwave before giving it to him. She also gave me an allowance and asked me to order whatever I wanted from the local restaurant. Before leaving, Mr. Parsons turned back to look at his son and said, Listen, Jimmy. You're going to behave yourself, okay? When we get back, we expect Kathy to only say nice things about you. You got it? He asked. Jimmy nodded and went back to his game as the Parsons bid goodbye and they left for the concert. Things were quiet for the next 20 minutes. Jimmy continued to play his game while I ruffled through a magazine and was simultaneously chatting with friends on my phone. I kept occasionally glancing at Jimmy to keep an eye on him. He was well behaved thus far and kept to himself. A few more minutes went by. Then I heard a small thud. Jimmy just casually threw his console away on the floor. Then he placed his legs on the table in front of him and sat back in his sofa with his hands resting behind his head and fingers interlocked. He was looking at me. I am bored, he said. I smiled at him and closed my magazine. Would you like to watch some TV? Is there any cartoon or anime that is your favorite? I asked. He just kept staring at me while twirling his toes. Dance for me, he said. Excuse me? I replied, totally taken aback. Dance, sing, do whatever you want. Mom and Dad are paying you to be here, right? So go ahead, entertain me, he said. You arrogant little twerp. Who do you think you are? I thought to myself. But I couldn't speak to him like that. He's still just a kid. Jimmy, didn't your parents teach you to be respectful of elders? I don't appreciate the way you've been talking to me, I said. I then continued, Now, if you are bored, I can switch on the TV or read a story from a favorite book of your choice. Boring! He said immediately looking away. What would you like to do? Are you hungry? Shall I heat and give you the food your mom prepared for you? I asked. He turned to look at me and asked, Do you have a boyfriend? No, I replied back before I could even help myself. He smirked. Ha! I thought as much, he said. For the first time, my face was flush with anger, and I was trying hard to compose myself. I was letting this kid get to me. Jimmy then got up from his chair and said, On second thoughts, I am hungry. Let's order pizza. He took the cordless phone and began to dial. I got up, walked towards him, and removed the phone from his hand. Your mother gave strict instructions not to order out. You'll have to eat what she made for you, I said. No, I won't, and you can't force me, he retorted. He looked ready to throw a fit. I took up my phone and told him, I am going to call your dad now. Your parents are not going to be happy to hear what I have to say. 
The stern warning was working. Jimmy realized the consequences of what would follow and finally said, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. It's all right, Jimmy. Now what would you like to eat? Are you hungry? I asked him. The little boy thought for a moment and then asked, Is it okay if I can hug you? Please, he said, smiling sweetly with folded hands. I smiled and nodded. The boy came forward and gave me a warm hug. And then I suddenly felt a searing pain in my body. Jimmy bit me in the arm and quickly moved back. As I stood there rubbing my arm in shock, he came towards me again and this time grabbed my phone. He ran towards the window and threw it out. Jimmy! I yelled in anger. I opened the front door and peered outside. The phone landed in the garden, which was populated with all kinds of plants and shrubs. The place was also poorly lit. I turned back to him angrily. You better stay put in your place or else you will really be sorry, I warned him. He took the hint and sat back on his chair. I then went out to search for my phone. I was crouched on all fours, combing the place with my hands in all that darkness, hoping I would somehow find it. A few minutes passed by and then I heard the door slam shut. I started panicking and rushed back towards the door. As I got closer to the entrance, I heard a loud noise. It was not Jimmy's. It sounded like a much older man. He was inside the house with Jimmy and was yelling at the top of his voice. Where's the money, boy? Where's your father kept it? He roared. Shut up! Stop crying! I'm going to smack you if you don't stop now! The man warned. I could hear Jimmy crying, and I began to panic. I started banging on the door. I was really worried about the boy's safety. Please! I don't know anything about that! I heard Jimmy reply back. Then, I heard something crash to the floor, accompanied by the sounds of running footsteps from inside the house. Jimmy was shouting, Help! Somebody please help me! Please! No! Leave me! Please! Ah! Jimmy was screaming at the top of his lungs. Now even I started yelling from outside while continuing to bang on the door. Jimmy! Jimmy! I cried. Things suddenly went quiet, but it was only for a fleeting moment, and then I heard another crash at the back of the house. I ran back to see what happened. The back door was left open. I slowly tiptoed towards the door and peered inside. I couldn't find anybody. I then rushed indoors towards the living room. I saw Jimmy lying on the floor, face down, in a pool of his own blood. I ran towards the boy in absolute panic and turned him over. I couldn't even figure out if he was dead or unconscious. I couldn't even check his pulse because my hands were trembling. I got up to get the phone. I dialed the number to call an ambulance. And then I heard that voice again, this time from behind me. I'm going to kill you, he roared. I turned back in absolute horror, thinking this was going to be the end of me. I realized I was looking at a giant TV screen with a picture of an angry man on it. Then the picture came to life. The man on the screen started yelling again. Pause. He froze. Play. I'm coming for you. He said. Pause. He froze again. With the phone still held to my ear, I slowly turned around to look where I found Jimmy lying on the floor. He was sitting upright on his knees with a TV remote in his hand and an evil grin on his face. The obnoxious brat had been playing me all along. Everything was fake. The attack, the cries for help, the blood on his t-shirt, it was all fake. Why would you do this to me? I asked him, unable to hide my helplessness. Well, I saw the film Home Alone with my parents last month. I've been simply wanting to try this since then, he answered back. I was fighting back tears that were welling up inside me, but I didn't want to give this kid the satisfaction of seeing me break down. The last thing I needed right now was him to start calling me a crybaby. Deep down, I really, really wanted to spank that brat. Then, I heard a knock on the door. Mr. Parsons, is everything okay? I heard a voice from the outside. This is Dominique, your neighbor. 
We heard screams from your home. He said. Is everything all right? He asked as he continued to knock on the door. I finally felt a tinge of relief. I have known Uncle Dominic since I was a kid, and he was a kind man. I walked towards the door and opened it. He was standing with three other people. All were looking concerned. Kathy, what are you doing here? What is going on? He asked. Before I could reply, I saw his expression change from confusion to alarm. He just barged into the living room. When I turned back, I saw Jimmy slumped on the sofa, unconscious, with blood stains all over his shirt. Dominique urgently patted him on the cheek, and he remained unresponsive. He then sprinkled some water on his face and the boy started slowly to regain consciousness. I stood there, awestruck, watching the drama continue to unfold in front of me. Where, where am I? Jimmy asked, trying to look all groggy and confused. You're at home, my child. Are you okay? What happened? Dominique asked, pointing to his clothes. I stepped forward to answer. Uncle Dominique is all fine. He is just acting. Dominique raised his hand and gestured to me to keep quiet. He then asked another neighbor to fetch a doctor who lived two houses away. Then the screaming started again. She, she is a monster! Jimmy yelled out with his finger pointed at me. Keep her away from me, please. Please, please, sir. He cried with his eyes closed heavily leaning into Uncle Dominique as if requiring his protection. All of them were staring at me now. I could no longer control my tears. They were just flowing down my face. It was bad enough to be treated shabbily by this kid in private. But now, people who I grew up knowing my entire life were giving me looks like I was some kind of tyrant. I just wanted to get back home and hug my parents. I couldn't take this any longer. I ran towards the entrance and threw the front door wide open and was shocked to see a policeman standing in front of me. Did the neighbors complain? Am I going to be arrested? I thought to myself as I struggled to control my pounding heart. Is this the parson's home? He asked me. I nodded. Are you the babysitter, Kathy? He continued. I nodded again. Where is Jimmy? He then asked. I pointed my finger at a future Oscar winner. For the first time, I saw genuine fear in his eyes. The little rascal finally realized he had gone too far. I quickly explained to the officer what happened, and it didn't take him long to believe me. The little twerp couldn't even look him in the eye. The officer then told me, You both are coming with me to the station. Before I could put in another word, a couple of constables escorted me and Jimmy into the police car. Why am I being taken to the station, officer? I haven't done anything wrong, I protested, but I was met with all-around silence. When we reached the place, I saw Mr. and Mrs. Parsons in the station as well. I was shocked to see them locked behind bars. They also looked oddly dressed in full black gear, very different from the classy attire they had worn for the concert. Then, on the table, I saw a shotgun and other semi-automatic weapons wrapped in evidence bags. The realization began to finally dawn on me. These people were some kind of criminals. The officer walked up to me and said, Mr. and Mrs. Parson have been arrested for trying to rob a diamond merchant. They shot and injured people during the heist, so they will be going to prison for a long time. He asked. I nodded my head. I looked at Jimmy. He had been seated on a bench across the other end of the hall. He was staring into an abyss and looked lost in his own thoughts. I could see that he was trying to grapple with the consequences of what was about to come. His life was going to change completely from now on. I sat next to him on the bench and gently wrapped my arms around him. He hugged me back and started crying inconsolably. Gwen and Adam Smith were considered to be a part of the elite of our town for more than a decade. Their success story was an inspiration to every kid in our town. Both of them were extremely successful, Gwen a lawyer and Adam a surgeon. Both of them were extremely busy with their work and lived on the far side of town, on top of the lone hill in a big mansion. They hardly had time for their twin kids, Lucy and Lincoln. This is where I come into the picture. I'm Susan, and I used to babysit Lucy and Lincoln on most nights a week. I picked them up from school in the afternoon made sure they did their homework, 
cooked dinner for them, and put them to bed. I was more of a nanny to both the kids rather than being a mere babysitter. The pay didn't hurt one bit, and most of the times the kids were well behaved. It wasn't much work, plus their parents did not mind if I used their internet or watched TV while the kids nap. This job was helping me pay my mother's medical bills and keeping our family afloat. It was a win-win for all, until it wasn't. Everything went downhill after that one phone call on that fateful stormy night. There is something you guys should know. I never used to babysit the kids on a weekend, as it was a time they spent with their parents, bonding and catching up, is what Mrs. Smith described it as. It never really bothered me, as I got the weekends off to spend with my family and drive my mom to the doctors. That night, it was around 8.30, when me and my mom and my brother returned from one of my mother's routine checkups. She has stage 2 cancer, so hospital visits are as often for our family as visiting the grocery store. It was a Saturday, and my phone started ringing. I initially thought it was one of my friends wanting to catch up in the local bar, but instead, my screen displayed Mrs. Smith's name. I was a bit confused, as she never texted or called on a weekend, unless it was an emergency. I picked up the call and asked, Hello, Mrs. Smith, what's the matter? Hi, Susan, sorry to bother you, but could you look after the kids tonight? I and Adam have to go to a dinner party. It was very unusual as the couple was almost adamant about spending time with their kids on the weekend. Sure, Mrs. Smith. I'll be there in an hour. Let me settle my mom in and I'll head over. Sure thing, Susan. We are waiting for you. Mrs. Smith, or should I say Gwen, hung up and I went back to taking care of my mom. By the time I left my home, mom had slept and my brother was watching TV. On the drive to their mansion, the road was unusually foggy, as if preventing me from reaching their house. I wish I would have returned to mine, but the thought of piling up bills in my mom's deteriorating condition kept me on the road. In about 40 minutes, I was there in their driveway, parking my beat-up car. Gwen and Adam were in their driveway, too, getting into their brand-new SUV. Hey there, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I greeted the couple. Hey, Susan. Gwen greeted me back, and Adam just nodded at me. The twins are asleep. It's already past their bedtime. I and Adam will return late tonight. Just keep them company. Don't let them have a midnight snack, and just text me if you need anything. Gwen instructed me before leaving, and got into the passenger seat beside her husband. It was a little weird that their driver was missing. I didn't think much of it back then. Maybe it was a last-minute plan and the driver couldn't make it as I did. Before their car rolled out the front gate, Gwen yelled and let me know she saved a piece of chocolate cake for me and that it was on the counter. Yep, yeah, fancy desserts were a common thing too. I loved this job. Once I entered the mansion, it was dark inside. Usually the couple left a few lights on at all times to keep the house illuminated. I switched on a few lights in the drawing room, grabbed a piece of chocolate cake and sat on the couch watching TV. For the first hour, I was so engrossed in the TV and the dessert that I did not notice that the house was too quiet, as if I was the only one there. The kids slept through the night on most days, but sometime either of them would wake up for a midnight snack or have a bad dream. It was common for me to put them back to bed and maybe read a bedtime story too. I thought it must be one of those days when the twins slept through the entire night. Still, my instinct told me something was wrong. I waited for half an hour more and then headed upstairs to the kids' room. Lucy and Lincoln had separate bedrooms on either side of the hallway, and then at the end of the hallway was the master bedroom where their parents slept. When I opened Lucy's bedroom, I wasn't much worried when I found it empty. The girl often slept in her brother's room if she was scared or had a bad dream. But the sight I saw when I opened Lincoln's bedroom door is etched into my memory forever. Both the kids were hanged by a noose from the ceiling fan. Their eyes were still open, as if they were very much alive. I tried to free them, but when I touched Lucy's body, she was cold and stiff, as if she had passed away hours ago. I knew Lincoln was no different. 
I screamed and stumbled out of the room. I ran toward the master bedroom to fetch the emergency phone Gwen left in there. But when I opened the master bedroom door, I knew I was in deep, deep trouble. Both Mr. and Mrs. Smith were hanging by the ceiling fan, the exact same way their kids were hanged just down the hall. I was terrified and screaming and running back downstairs I didn't know what to do. I could still feel their open eyes on me as I called 911. When the cops got there, I was sitting in the driveway, weeping and hysteric. I did not know what was going on. The police did their investigation and questioned me. I told them all that had happened and also mentioned the fact that I had spoken to Gwen and Adam as they left the mansion. I did not understand how they were hanging inside their own bedroom when they left in front of my own eyes. Naturally, I was pinned as the prime suspect for the murder of a family of four. Right now, I'm narrating this story to you from a prison cell where I have been locked for the past six years. They say I killed the Smith family, but I swear I didn't do it. I would never harm the kids nor their parents. They say I'm insane and have mental disorders. How is that possible? I'm totally fine. Can't they see I'm being framed for murder? I told them I met the couple before they went out for the dinner party, but the investigators say that I didn't meet the couple in the driveway. I clearly remember meeting them though. I asked them to check the CCTV footage, but the footage they showed me has me standing in the driveway alone. No sight of Mr. or Mrs. Smith. They say I forced the family to hang themselves. Why would I do that? They were paying my bills by giving me employment. Why would anyone want to lose such a job? I firmly believe that I'm being framed, but all the evidence is against me. The CCTV had recorded me arriving in the mansion, but I clearly remember talking to Gwen. I remember eating the last piece of chocolate cake. How would I know that there was a single slice of chocolate cake if Gwen hadn't mentioned it? Why is anyone not believing me? I couldn't even attend my mother's funeral as the doctors and the cops think I'm too dangerous for the world. They think I can hurt people. How is that possible? I was just a girl who was trying to provide for her family and take care of her mom. Why does no one see that I'm being framed? I don't know what's going on anymore. I'm so confused and lost. All I know is that I didn't do it. What do you think is the truth? Am I innocent? Who did I see in the driveway if the couple was already dead? And more importantly, who called me pretending to be Mrs. Smith? I swear, I didn't do it. How many of you believe in demonic possession? I would say many of you enjoy watching those horror movies, but in real life, hardly anyone believes in things like demonic spirits or ghosts until they experience it firsthand. Being a horror freak, I did not miss a single horror movie. You name it, I must have seen it at some point. But like traumatic endings of some horror movies, my life too did not go as I planned, and I ended up working in the Burger King. My job was not even flipping the patties or taking the orders. Nope, I worked as a cleaner. I made sure the Burger King outlet was clean first thing in the morning and last thing in the evening. I mostly worked throughout the day picking up trash and trays left by people on the tables. I wiped the floors whenever necessary and washed the dishes whenever necessary. Every day, hundreds of people visit Burger King. But we have a nurse that works in the hospital opposite to us. She comes here for lunch every afternoon. And with her is her little daughter, Maria. Both of them come here almost every day. The majority of the staff members know these two and their orders by heart. Little Maria won't be more than five. She is a special child as she has mild autism and need some medical care. Good for the little girl, her mother is a nurse. So every morning, Mary brings her daughter to the hospital with her for therapy, and every afternoon, they come here to grab a bite. Then she drives little Maria to her grandparents and returns to work. Never before this had I dealt with an autistic child. But Maria is pretty sweet and is friends with most of the staff. So she is not scared of us. But to comfort herself, she carries a little rag doll with her everywhere. They say it's to make her feel comfortable. 
The rag doll makes her feel grounded and safe in some ways, says her mom. Hell, what do I know? If the doll makes the kid happy, so be it. But now Mary is going to be six and most probably go to school. So her doctor and therapist thought that it's time she lets go of the toy. So for the last few weeks, they have been working on separating the doll from the child. So far, no success. She had the doll since she was born. It was gifted to her by her late grandmother, and by the condition of the doll, you could say that it has seen better days. Although the doctors are patient with the kid, Mary is not. She thought it would be best if she took the doll away from her daughter once and for all. Sure, she would cry and throw a hissy fit, but Mary was ready to handle it. Mary thought that Maria would get bullied in school if she carried a doll everywhere with her. Nonetheless, a very beaten up old doll. So the day Mary planned to do this, she brought Maria to our Burger King and ordered some extra food, especially the items Maria liked. Mary had planned to leave the doll behind in the Burger King and pretend that they had lost the doll, so it would hurt Maria less. She had spoken to a few of the staff members about her plan, and we were all going to help Mary distract Maria. I was entrusted with the job of slowly sneaking off with the doll while Maria was busy eating. I had to make sure Maria does not notice me, or worse, catch me in the act. The day comes when we have to execute the plan. Little Maria enters the Burger King with her mother, and she looked tired from her daily therapy. One of her hands was holding her mother's, and the other clutching the damn doll. They sit at their regular table, and the waitress brings their food, the extra cheese fries, and milkshake on its way. Maria is happy to see that her mom is treating her with all her favorite food items. She momentarily forgets her doll, and that's when I go to their table, pretending to take their empty trays, and I pick up the doll, too. Maria was so focused on her food that she did not notice her precious toy missing. But before I could discreetly return the doll to Mary, she got a phone call from the hospital, and she left in a rush, almost dragging little Maria behind her. The poor girl just grabbed her milkshakes and walked away with her mother. No thoughts about the doll. I guess that I was left taking care of the doll for the night. The next day when Maria and Mary would come, I had planned to return the doll to the girl's mother. In the meantime, I decided to keep the doll in the supply closet with all my cleaning stuff. The doll was so dirty that it fit right in there. I continued my shift and paid little attention to the doll. At around 10.30 when all the staff left, and I was left with the responsibility to clean the restaurant and lock it up. I walked to the supply closet and opened it to grab my cleaning supplies. But surprisingly, the doll wasn't there. I searched through the closet and found it had fallen at the bottom. Instead of locking up the doll again, I decided to place it on a table and start working. I often clean the kitchen area first as it gets dirtier. Once I finish cleaning one area, I switch off the light and move to the next. I had placed the doll on a table close to the kitchen area, and once I was done cleaning it, I switched off the light, plunging the table into darkness. I continued cleaning, whistling to myself. That's when I see a moment through the corner of my eye. I instantly turn towards the table with the doll and freeze mid-cleaning. The doll was no longer laying flat on the table, but was standing and bent in a weird position. However, what scared me the most were the glowing red, orangish eyes that seemed to pierce through my soul. Next thing I know, the doll's head twists backward, and it's all like it's a horror movie. Instead of being a brave person, I just dropped my supplies and ran home. I did not even bother to lock the Burger King. The next morning when I reach the restaurant, the manager is already at my throat for being so careless and leaving the restaurant open. I explained to him what had happened, and he threw the rag doll which was still on the table at my face and fired me on the spot. But I knew that something was very wrong with the doll, and now I'm sitting on the sidewalk waiting for Mary with a doll in my hand and without a job. Now that I look at it, its button eyes and old frilly clothes are the same as they were before. No sign of any demonic possession. So is the doll really possessed, or is there a problem with my head? Urban legends and myths have always been something my friends and I used to have a lot of fun with while growing up. We would occasionally scare or prank each other, but apart from this childish interest, we never really took any steps to find out if these myths were real or not. That was until our last week in high school when we decided it was time to take the next step. 
My friend Jason and I had watched a couple of YouTube videos where people played games summoning myths and demons. From Charlie Charlie to Bloody Mary, the idea of encountering a supernatural being or spirit intrigued us and left us asking if these myths were truly myths or actual reality. A question that would eventually leave us all wishing we never asked. It was our last week of high school, and while most people our age were out partying and planning, I decided what my friends and I needed to do together before leaving for college was something we'd always wanted to do. My parents were out of town that week, so I figured there was no better time. I got on my computer and looked up some of the most popular urban myths to summon, but most instructions were either unclear or too complicated to carry out in my home. Eventually, I found a site that had listed numerous urban legends, stories, and instructions on how to summon, although warning against it. I spent a while on the site till I eventually found a game I had never heard of. One Man Hide and Seek. The next day I told my friends about the plan. Sophie was skeptical at first, but Jason and I helped her relax and I told them to come over later that day so I could explain the rules and what I would need from each of them. Okay guys, this is called One Man Hide and Seek and the rules of the game are simple. I continued, first we need a doll that doesn't look human but has limbs. So Sophie, I think one of your rag dolls as a kid should work. Next. We cut the dowel open with a needle, removing its stuffing and filling it with rice. I was interrupted by Jason saying, Sorry, did you say rice? I replied, Yes, the rice attracts the demon. Then we clip our nails and put them in with the rice. We aren't supposed to put the nails of other people or else they might get hurt. After that, we take a piece of red thread and sew the dowel back up without cutting off the extra length. Instead, we take the extra length and tie it around the dowel before tying the two ends together. Um, the site said this represents the dowel's blood vessels and traps the spirit into the dowel? I was interrupted again by Sophie and Jason laughing, but I couldn't understand why they found it a bit funny, so I continued reading the instructions. We filled the bathtub with water and put the dowel in there to separate the spirit world from the real world. Then we find a room with a TV to hide in. So I was thinking the living room. We purify the room we're hiding in. Jason, your mom still has those instant candles she uses for yoga, right? Jason simply nodded and I continued. We'll place a cup of salt water and the needle in the room. Then we give the doll a name. Not ours and not anyone we know. Jason raised his hand before saying, Lucia. Sophie and I didn't seem to have any issues with the name, so I continued giving instructions. It was getting a bit late now, so I decided to hurry up. After that, we turn off all the lights and devices apart from the TV. Then we say to the doll three times, we are the first it. Then we run to the room, turn on the TV, and stay as quiet as possible. Sophie then said, hold on, why does the TV have to be on and what happens if we aren't quiet enough? Are you scared? He said laughing. I responded with, the room went silent for a while, but I continued. We close our eyes and count to 10. Once we're done, we get the needle, go back to the bathtub and say to the doll, we have found you, Lucia. Then we cut the thread, binding the doll and say three times, Lucia, you are the next it. We turn the doll to the tub and hide in the room. We remain as silent as possible, fill our mouths with salt water and search for Lucia. Most times it remains in the bathroom, so no need to worry. When we find the doll, we spray the salt water from our mouths on its face and say, we have found you. Then we burn the doll and discard its remains. I looked up to see a worried look on Sophie's face and she eventually said, so what happens if it's not in the bathroom and we can't find it? I didn't have an answer to that, so I responded with, the site doesn't say anything about that, but that's why we have to keep the salt water on us as protection, that's it. The concern on their faces became more obvious, and a part of me began to think, maybe it wasn't such a good idea. But I brushed the feeling off, and they simply went home agreeing to be back at mine by midnight. Sophie returned around 11 p.m., as she said. She didn't want to be out on the streets by midnight, while Jason, on the other hand, didn't arrive until 1 in the morning. I wasn't sure we had enough time to set up, as the game had to be played at exactly 3 a.m., but immediately, Jason arrived we had it all set up in around 30 minutes. 
The rag doll Sophie had gotten was green and was also missing one of its button eyes. But we didn't think that would be a problem as the doll didn't look human at all and that was all that mattered. Eventually, it was almost 3 a.m. and it seemed Jason had gotten over his paranoia if he had any as no one was more excited than him to play the game. At around 2.58 a.m., we turned the lights off, turned on the TV, and before we knew it, it was time. We all walked into the bathroom, and the sight of a floating rag doll in a bathtub filled with water wasn't as creepy as I thought it would be. Jason walked up to Lucia, picked her up, and said, Jason, Sophie, and Mark are the first it. Jason, Sophie, and Mark are the first it. Jason, Sophie, and Mark are the first it. He returned the doll to the tub, and we all moved back to the living room. Nothing out of the ordinary was happening, so we closed our eyes and began counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Before I could say ten, I heard a thud followed by a light scream. So I immediately opened my eyes to see Jason holding on to Sophie and laughing. We stayed laughing for a while before eventually deciding to finish the game. I returned to the bathroom to see the doll still floating in the tub. At this point, I was feeling more comfortable now. So I picked up the doll and cut the thread with the needle before saying, We have found you. You are the next it, Lucia. It was only as I said those words, I realized something strange. Despite being submerged in water for a while now, the doll in my hand was nowhere near wet. In fact, it almost felt completely dry. I returned the doll to the tub and we immediately went back to the living room, to the living room and filled our mouths with salt water. After waiting for a while, once again, nothing strange happened and I could see relief on Sophie's face. At this point, I decided it was time to finally end the game. But as we began walking towards the bathroom, Jason spat the water from his mouth and said, <laughs> This was fun, guys, but it was obviously all a load of crap. I opened the door once again, expecting to see the funny sight of a rag doll floating in my tub for the third time that night. But all I felt that instant were chills run down my spine. Literally. The bathroom was eerily cold, and I could almost hear my heartbeat as I was met by the sight of the bathtub filled with nothing but completely still water. What the hell? Jason said. But before he could say more, we heard a loud sound come from the living room. We slowly walked back into the living room to see the TV randomly changing channels from one to another before eventually losing audio and then switching off plunging the room into darkness. I immediately rushed to turn on the lights. A look of fear was all over Sophie and Jason's face, and I couldn't help but wonder if I had made a terrible mistake making them play the game. Guys, let's just calm down, find the doll, and spray the salt water on its face. As long as we stay together, we should be fine. Sophie responded with, Why can't we just leave and go home? I could tell she was completely bothered now, so I replied calmly, the site warned us against leaving because our nails are in the doll. It won't just let us go on with our lives. So relax. Come on. Let's just find the doll. We looked around the house for about an hour. All the while, hearing loud thuds and sounds that didn't seem normal to anyone. The phones had lost all signal and leaving the house wasn't an option. The longer we took, the more things we began to hear. And eventually... We could hear what seemed like laughter coming from all around the house. It was a deep laugh, and we couldn't tell exactly which direction it was coming from. That was until the voice finally spoke. Mark, Sophie, Jason, if what you seek is to return me to my realm, then come find me upstairs. But I warn you, I will not return alone. A soul must come back with me. The voice was strangely deep, and the house felt extremely cold now. What does that mean? Sophie said. Jason responded with, You know what it means. They looked at me as if asking what next to do, but I was completely scared now, and I could tell they were too. Let's go find it. Here. I said, handing them the glass of salt water. 
no matter what. Don't let the salt water out of your mouths and let's stay together. Immediately, we walked upstairs. We could feel the temperature drop and more laughter filled the house. Only this time, it was obviously coming from my parents' room. Jason began walking towards the room while we followed behind. And as we arrived at the door, everything went completely silent. Jason slowly pushed the door open, but before we could walk in, he was pulled in and the door slammed behind him. I immediately began banging on the door, but it was as if someone was holding it firmly in place. I kept kicking and kicking till eventually it broke and I walked into the horrific sight of Lucia seated on Jason. His hands appeared to be pinned to the floor and although Lucia's hands weren't even close to Jason, huge claw-like marks were all over his chest. I stood frozen, looking at the horrific scene of my best friend Jason being mutilated by a doll. The doll abruptly paused and looked at me for a second. I could almost see a smile on its face, but before I could react, it was immediately covered in salt water from Sophie's mouth. Later that night, I burnt the doll and discarded its remains. The phone started working not long after the doll was burnt, and Sophie quickly called an ambulance. Jason survived the encounter, and no matter how many times we tried to explain the situation, there was no way the police were going to be convinced what we were saying was actually the truth. The police tried for months to make sense of the case, as the marks on Jason didn't seem human at all, and his story correlated with ours, but eventually they closed the case, stating we had been under the influence and Jason was probably attacked by an animal that night. A conclusion I could only wish was true. After that night, our curiosity for urban myths and legends completely faded, and sadly, so did our friendship. I am a father now, and I still spend hours wondering why the demon left Jason alive. The sleepless nights are less now, but I'll never forgive myself for putting their lives in danger, all in the name of an urban myth. Despite my experience, I wouldn't tell you all urban myths have some truth behind them, but I know for a fact that you should never play the game. One man, hide and seek. I'm Zach Marshall, and recently due to work, I moved to Japan. Now, moving from the States to a country like Japan is a big cultural difference. Not to mention, I didn't speak even a word of Japanese. But my work demanded me to be there, so I had no choice but to go. When I first landed, the difference in everything was very striking, but slowly I adapted myself and became accustomed to their ways of life. There were many things I loved about Japan. One of them is their train service. Back in the States, I had to drive for hours to get from one place to another. There was no way around driving. If you had to get places, you were forced to have a car. After moving here, I got a much-needed break from behind the wheel. Almost everything here is within walking distance from my apartment, and I take a train every morning to my office. The work environment is very good, and all the people, friends or strangers, are extremely kind. Not to mention the women are extremely beautiful, too. As I made friends in my office, I got to learn a lot about Japanese culture from them. So, all of them had been to the States, so they knew the difference between Japan and the U.S. But the ones who hadn't left Japan were very curious regarding my life back home. We usually had lunch together during our breaks, and while the Japanese cuisine was growing on me, so was the culture. During one of our lunch breaks, Sandro Yoshida, a Japanese-British colleague of mine, asked me, Zach, you travel by train every day, so do you know the legend of Tek Tek? This was the first time I was hearing about Tek Tek. I had heard a lot of stories about Japan and its history, but nothing about Tek Tek. No. What is a Tek Tek? I asked innocently. Suddenly, the whole table fell silent. It was like I'd asked a stupid question. All seven members sitting around the table were just staring at me. Sandro continued, It's an urban legend. Oh, another urban legend. Sounds interesting. What's it about? I asked, very excited to know more about this story. Well, not long ago, when the Japanese train service started, not many people knew how to navigate it. It was uh, pretty new for everyone. A girl who wanted to travel by train met with an accident. 
She fell on the track and a fast train went over her body, splitting her in half. Her head was separated from the rest of her body. Back then, it was big news, and after her accident, many more safety measures were taken. Passengers were educated on how to travel by train. The death of that girl was national news for days. But that's not the scary part. If anything, her death increased the safety of the other passengers. However, over the years there had been many reports of people traveling by train late and spotting a head of a woman floating in trains or on railway stations. This head looked exactly like the deceased girl with long flowy straight hair. Whoever is unfortunate enough to be spotted by this head dies the same way that girl died. This is called the urban legend of Tech Tech, Sandro told me. So far I had not encountered anything other than present strangers on the train, and I didn't believe in such urban legends. A woman's head floating around in trains and platforms. <laughs> Are you kidding me? It even sounded absurd. But seeing the looks everyone was giving me, I didn't dare to crack a joke. Instead, I asked the most obvious question. Has any one of you seen a tech tech? No. Most of them shook their heads. This confirmed my suspicion internally. This was just a made-up story to scare children from traveling at night. But Havru, one of my female colleagues, looked dead serious. I haven't, but my father has. He was a factory worker a decade ago and had worked in shifts. One night, when he was taking the train to go for his night shift, hardly anyone was there on the platform. He was waiting for his train when he spotted something slithering between the train tracks. At first he thought it was a rodent or perhaps a stray cat, but when he looked closer, he spotted the wide red eyes, the feminine features, and he instantly knew it was Tech Tech. Before the head could spot him, he rushed back home. He never took the train again after sunset. I know this may seem like a joke to you, but it's true. Many people have died due to Tech Tech. Well, I believe it if you say so. I didn't want to argue with Haru. She could be a stubborn woman sometimes. Many months passed after our lunch conversation about Tech Tech. To be honest, I had totally forgotten about that urban legend altogether. I still took the train and enjoyed not having to drive everywhere. Plus, I was getting more and more comfortable in my life in Japan. Most days of the week, I used to get home by 7 in the evening. But on this one particular day, all of my colleagues and I decided to go out for dinner and drinks to celebrate our successful completion of a project. Although I was not much into it, I decided to go along, not wanting to disappoint anyone. By the time we were all done with food and the alcohol, it was midnight. I wasn't drunk, as I had nothing but two beers but the others were pretty wasted. I made sure everyone had a ride home, and then I walked towards the train station. It was my first time traveling at this hour, so I was surprised to see that the platform was completely empty. Not a single soul besides me was in sight. There were ten minutes before my train got there, so I decided to just sit on the bench and wait. I scrolled through my phone, and suddenly... From the corner of my eyes, I saw something moving under the bench opposite to mine. At first, I ignored it, but when I got a good look, I was running out of the train station like a madman. Right there in front of me was the head of a human woman, and it was moving in circles in weird patterns. There was straight, jet-black flowy hair attached to it, and saucer big eyes. That's when I remembered the urban legend of Tech Tech, and knew but it was indeed real. As I ran, I thought that the head had not spotted me, but then I turned around, and the head was slithering behind me. It had spotted me, and now it was chasing me. I didn't want to die a violent death, so I ran as fast as I could, and finally I got out of the train station. Still, there were no people around. That's when I spotted the silhouette of a woman. From a distance, I could only see her body up to her shoulders. But when I took a closer look, I saw that she didn't have a head. Instead, she stooped below and picked up the slithered head. 
I was terrified looking at this headless woman with her head in her hand. This was Tech Tech, and people didn't know the whole story of this urban legend. It was not just a slithering head of a woman hunting people, but it was a headless body as well. But to date, I cannot forget the sight of that horrific woman. It's etched into my brain. Luckily, Tech Tech doesn't follow anyone out of the train station, and I narrowly escaped her wrath. Although I'm still in Japan, and I still use the railway every day, I never travel by train after sunset. And now when anyone tells me about urban legends, instead of laughing at them, a small part of me actually believes them. Hey, my name is Helen, and I have a question for you. Do you believe in the paranormal? Do you believe that there are unexplained things? Things beyond our understanding? Or do you believe that, given enough time, you could understand the origin of anything? I used to be one of those people. Those people who don't believe in anything. But after that night in the elevator, that night when I received the strange call, I was forced to believe. It all started on a Saturday. That day, my grandmother had called me on the phone, but since I was taking a bath, I couldn't answer it. I received the missed call and immediately called her, but no one answered. I didn't really expect a call from her since we had a very bad relationship. I don't know why I would do it, but I always felt like she hated me. I never did anything but treat her well, but she seemed to have her disdain for me. She never looked at me and always avoided any contact with me. And when we were alone, she would hit me. Once I grew up, I stopped talking to her and cut off any kind of relationship with her. So you can imagine that receiving a call like that seemed very strange to me. Worried, I called my mom to let her know. She told me she had missed a call as well. My mom lived really far away, so I had no way to see my grandmother. So she told me to go check on her and make sure everything was okay. I really didn't like having to see my grandmother. Since I'm an adult, she treats me with a little more respect, but I still feel like she hates me since she doesn't do much to hide it. Anyway, I knew I had to go. I was doing this for my mother, not for her. Unwillingly but willingly, I put on a jacket and went to take the elevator of the apartment where I lived. There were people taking it on another floor, so I took the stairs. I started to go down the stairs, but in the middle of my distraction, something happened. Suddenly, my cell phone rang, and to my surprise, I almost fell down the stairs. Angry, I got up and grabbed my cell phone from the floor. I hate the stairs. Next time, I'll take the elevator. When I picked up the phone, I breathed a sigh of relief. It was my grandmother. I answered it, thinking that with this call, I would see what she wanted, and I wouldn't have to go to her house. But when I picked it up, I was very worried. On the other end of the phone, no one was talking to me. All I heard was agitated, even violent breathing. It was as if... The person on the other end was choking. I tried to call 911, but for some reason, the phone wouldn't hang up. I tried to turn it off, but I couldn't either. The call was still active, and on the other end, I heard a lady breathing. That was definitely my grandmother. I sent a message to my mom telling her to call the ambulance and ran to her house, hoping to save her if something was happening to her. Luckily, she lived a few blocks away, so the drive was quick. During the ride, I tried to call her several times, but nothing. I could only hear her breathing getting more and more intense. I couldn't hear anyone else with her. She must have had an accident. When I was about to enter her house, something stopped me. I started to feel a very strong pain all over my head. It was a familiar pain, but intense. I fell to the floor, kneeling in pain, not knowing what to do, but I couldn't stop. I stood up and went into her apartment with the spare keys I had at home. As I entered her apartment, I quickly asked for the elevator, which was luckily nearby. She lived on the 10th floor, so there was no way she could climb the stairs. Grasping my head in pain, I got on the elevator and pushed the button to go to the floor where my grandmother lived. But halfway up, the elevator stopped and the lights went out. After a few seconds, other lights came on again. They were red and somewhat broken emergency lights. I took up my cell phone to send a picture to my mother telling her to let her know I was trapped. 
To make matters worse, my head hurt more than ever. When I activated the phone, I noticed that the call was still active, and my breathing was louder than ever. Activating the camera, I was about to take the picture, but something interrupted me. The camera was pointing to the floor, and I saw feet that were not mine. I ran the camera, and where those feet were, there was no one. As I put the camera back on, I felt the pain in my head get worse and worse. As a reflex action, I lifted the camera up, and there she was. It was my grandmother. My grandmother was pale, breathing violently as she squeezed my head violently. Now I remember that pain. That's the pain I felt when I was a child. My grandmother used to squeeze my head with her fingers when we were alone. Just like when I was a child, I couldn't free myself. The pain was too strong. I felt as helpless as when I was a child. As she hurt me, I could hear her dark breaths. It was exactly the same as the one I heard on the phone. At that moment, I realized that the noise on the phone was not coming from my grandmother's room. It was coming from next door to me. All this time, my grandmother's spirit was next to me, mistreating me. Was I going crazy? This couldn't be real. My grandmother squeezed harder and harder. I was losing consciousness, and I felt like I was going to break my skull. Amidst all the pain and desperation, I dropped the phone, which crashed to the floor and broke. Immediately after doing so, the light returned to the elevator, which continued on its way. My grandmother was no longer there. Terrified and disbelieving what had happened, I walked to my grandmother's house. Surely she was fine. Nothing that had happened made sense. This couldn't be real. As I entered her house, a deep smell of the dead invaded my nose. The police arrived at the same time I did, and upon seeing me, they recognized the smell and immediately pulled me out. They knew there was a dead body in that room. Soon after, my grandmother was confirmed dead. She had taken her own life in a ritual. From what the cops saw, the place was full of satanic drawings, and my grandmother had not died that day, but the corpse had been there for several days. During the investigation, they discovered that my grandmother was in a cult. There were also several pictures of me with the black candles around them. As soon as they told me that, I remembered that the phone that broke that day was a gift from my grandmother. It was the only gift she gave me in her life, and she had done it with a big smile. Since that day, I only go down or up the stairs to my apartment. I could never take an elevator again. Hi guys, my name is Alex, and believe it or not, I was one of the famous Burger King employees who worked in one of the most infamous Burger King branches. The bread that, although no one ever knew it, mistreated its employees the most. It all started when our old manager, who we'll call Jerry, was fired. We had a great time with Jerry. We were so relaxed, and he was so undemanding, we could hardly consider it a job. Yes, customers sometimes complained that we were late in shipping orders, but most of them left happy because they knew we made the food with a lot of love and effort. The bosses were not happy about this because they fired Jerry. At first, we all wondered if one of us would be the next manager. But since they felt that because of Jerry, we were all pretty lazy, they decided to look for someone from the outside. That's when Jean showed up. And that was the beginning of the end of our relaxing days and the beginning of a nightmare that seemed like it would never end. You see, Jean was obsessed with time. The man was always seen with at least three watches, always looking at them. Burger King executives loved this quality about him because whatever franchise he touched, that franchise radically improved his numbers. They were so obsessed with his accomplishments, no one stopped to think about how he did them. In the beginning, Gene was constantly rushing us. He didn't want us to rest for a second. The moment a customer arrived, we all had to soldier on and not let him wait five minutes. He couldn't stand us preparing the food on the spot. All the food had to be previously prepared and assembled according to the client to deliver it much faster. It was hell. Every time one of us would relax, Gene would appear from behind and yell wildly at him to get to work. It was as if he were everywhere at once, as if he had eyes on us all the time. In the first few weeks, he pushed us to the limit. Most of us thought for sure he was going to calm down, that he was probably trying to make a good impression and that he didn't want to give up in these first few days that he was still new. But needless to say, we were wrong. As time went by, 
Jean became more and more demanding. He got to the point of standing next to us and timing how long we could make a burger. Many of us complained about him at the end of working hours, but no one ever dared to confront him. Not because he was our boss, but because he was terrifying. The man had a dark presence and he looked at us with such hatred, with such disdain, that we felt that if we said anything to him, he would probably rip our heads off. As time went on, Gene's rules became more and more illogical. Once a week, he would force us to flip burgers next to him. If we took more than 20 seconds, we were financially penalized and part of our salary was taken away. Naturally, some of us started to quit. And this is where the really scary part began. Every time someone quit, Gene would get frantic. That day, you couldn't even look at him or he would scream at you with all his fury. The next day, Gene would go to work and the day after, he would come in in a very strange mood. As if something had happened the day he was absent. We tried to communicate with the guys who quit, but we could not. It was as if the people and their families disappeared off the face of the earth. We couldn't confirm it and we had no proof, but we knew Gene had something to do with it. Meanwhile, back at the shop, everything started to get worse. The time to make a hamburger was getting shorter and shorter. The only day we saw Gene happy was when a co-worker managed to do it in eight seconds. But that only made him even angrier at those of us who didn't make it. In the beginning, people were happy because the food was coming fast, but then the complaints started. We were making the food so fast that we forgot to put in ingredients or did it wrong. Every time this happened, Gene would wait until after work hours to yell at us and hit us. We were all too afraid to say anything to him or to quit. We were sure that something terrible would happen to us if we fought back. And not doing so, not standing up for ourselves, would make it all end in the worst of ways. I remember on the worst day of all, Gene met me outside work. He told us that this would be his last diamond, so he wanted to make sure the staff was prepared. We all smiled and thought that if we would never see him again after this, we would put up with anything. None of us imagined what Gene had prepared for us. Out of nowhere, the maniac pulled out a revolver and pointed it at all of us, who fell back in fear, raising our hands in the air. You see, guys, I can't allow any efficient personnel to remain on my last day. So, that's the way it's going to be. My shift ends at 9 p.m. You have 15 minutes to flip burgers without stopping. Whoever takes longer than 12 seconds will be fired. Quickly, he pointed the gun at us and made us pass one by one to make hamburgers. Meanwhile, he pointed the guns at our heads, insulted us, and even slapped us in the face. In the beginning, we all managed to do it in less than 12 seconds. But before it was my turn, one guy took a second too long. <laughs> Please, no! Without saying anything to him, Gene simply pulled the trigger and blew his head off. No cleaning the corpse! The rest will work here, in the blood and with her boyfriend by her side. Next! And after that, we all kept making burgers. The condiments were full of blood, but that didn't matter. That couldn't matter, because if we made them wrong, we would end up being another corpse. At that moment, we had to reveal ourselves. We should have all jumped against them, but can you blame us? We were just a bunch of scared teenagers. We just wanted to go home. Little by little, my companions began to fall and die. It was getting harder and harder to make hamburgers. The smell of blood was too much. Some of them started to vomit, but they couldn't even afford that as Jean threatened to kill them if they took too long. When it was my turn again, I tried to go make the hamburger, but something was happening to me. My legs, they weren't working. I wanted to move and I wanted to make the burger, but I just couldn't walk. Furious, Jean came up to me and grabbed me by the hair, putting my head on the counter full of blood and rubbing it as if it were a rag. Is that why you can't move, Alex? You better get used to the blood because if you don't make that hamburger, yours will be here too. You understand? Gathering all my energy, my body started working again and I could answer him. Yes, sir. I started to make the hamburger as fast as possible, but it was very difficult. My hands were shaking. I felt like I was doing everything wrong as if I was putting all the ingredients in automatic mode. I couldn't concentrate on my work, 
I just cried and begged to see my family one more time. Meanwhile, I felt the cold tube of Gene's gun on my head, squeezing me with disdain as if he couldn't stand the urge to blow my head off in front of everyone. As soon as I finished the hamburger, Gene stopped the stopwatch and with a huge smile, showed it to me. The stopwatch read, 12 seconds. I had made it. Well, guys, it's 9 p.m. It was a pleasure working with you. I know I'm leaving the place with capable people. After saying these words, Gene put the gun to his head and simply pulled the trigger. He fell dead instantly. After something so cruel and sadistic, you can imagine that this was news all over the world, right? Well, it wasn't. Burger King put up a huge amount of money so that this story would never become known. The victims' families were bribed and threatened. No one made a fuss. Burger King was too powerful, and everyone knew they were going to lose. My other co-workers and I quit immediately after that, and we even didn't give them time to look for replacements. Sometimes, I walk by the restaurant and see that it's open again, with kids like us, having fun. When I sit down to eat, I never again get nervous about how long the food will take. I appreciate that they take their time. Because every time food comes quickly, I am reminded of the stacked corpses of my co-workers and how close I came to being one of them. This happened to me and my family when we were living in Kansas City back in 2016. Clowns were all the rage, and scary clowns were a hot topic across the country. My wife Abby and I and my son Nick all lived in a nice house in a safe neighborhood. Every day in the news, there was at least one piece of news relating to a scary clown. It was either a prank or a serious crime or something along that line. However, around Halloween of 2016 and 17, there were a lot of people dressed as clowns. It was funny and weird at the same time. My son Nick, who was 15 back then, dressed as a creepy clown too. My wife and I had a good laugh looking at our silly-looking son. But soon, things took a turn for the worse. Now, you must know something about me. I'm a banker, but my father was a cop, which means I knew a lot about the police in the States. And being the son of a cop, I always made sure that our house was secure, which means making sure all the locks and bolts on the doors and windows are working okay. The ring camera and the one in our backyard are always on, etc. Abby always said that I exaggerated, but I just wanted to keep my family safe. Nothing wrong with that, right? A month after Halloween, there was a break-in into the house of an elderly couple that lived down the street. They said it was a clown carrying a machete. He threatened them and stole a bunch of valuables and money. The cops were working on the case when another break-in happened in one of the houses in our neighborhood. For the first time, a scary clown had struck our area. Now my wife was thanking me for being so serious about the security of our home. Although the neighborhood was on high alert, somewhere deep down I knew that the clown would strike a third time. Usually my wife and I slept in the master bedroom on the ground floor and my son slept in his room upstairs. But that day I decided to sleep on the couch in front of the TV. My wife was in our room and my son was fast asleep in his. Around two in the morning, my phone chimed beside me on the couch. I had fallen asleep with the TV on, so I immediately woke up when the notification popped up. It was from the ring camera. There was motion detected on our porch. I was immediately on high alert. I grabbed my phone and opened the app, and the scene I saw was straight out of a person's nightmare. There was a scary-looking clown on my front porch. He was just standing there, looking at the house. He also had a big machete in his hand, which he was holding right against his chest. He was dragging his right foot as if he had a limp. He was just acting weird, like a zombie. But I was the most scared when he stopped moving and noticed the ring camera. He became as still as a rock and just kept looking into the camera. Then he moved his face close to it. That's when I lost it. I knew it was unsafe to go out and confront him. Even though my father had taught me how to fight, I was no match for a blade-wielding crazy guy. That's when I remembered that my wife loved to sleep with the window open. 
I looked at the footage of the camera and the clown wasn't there. I ran to our bedroom and spotted the open window. Abby was sleeping peacefully. I yanked the window closed, and then the clown emerged from the side of the house. He must have heard the noise of the window closing. He raised his machete and moved it across his neck, making the I'll kill you motion. What happened, Brandon? My sleepy wife asked from the bed. Nothing, sweetie. You sleep. I didn't want to worry her. I grabbed my phone once again and climbed the stairs to my son's room. His window was locked and his blinds were drawn, which meant no one from the street should be able to spot him. I dialed 911 and told the operator my emergency. He said that the cops would be there in a few minutes. Almost five minutes after I hung up the phone, someone rang the doorbell. I saw the footage of the ring camera on my phone and saw a cop standing in front of my door. He was looking into the camera and showing me his badge. He was saying something, but we didn't have speakers installed. It was weird that the cop was able to get there so fast, especially given on average that the time it takes for cops to get to our neighborhood is around 10 to 15 minutes. Plus, it was weird for a single cop to show up at your door at night. They usually have a partner with them. So instead of opening the door immediately, I looked at the footage for a while. That's when I noticed that he wasn't a cop. Rather, he was a detective. Throughout my childhood and teenage years, I'd been around enough cops and detectives to know that only police officers responded to 911 calls, and never a detective. So, it was extremely odd for one to be on my porch. I kept watching the footage some more and noticed that the body language of that man was off. He might have dressed like a detective, but he wasn't one. He was someone else. That's when the man finally moved and walked a few steps away from the door. And to my utter shock, he had a limp in his right leg, too. In an instant, I knew what was going on. But before I could do anything, loud sirens could be heard down the road. The cops were here. The detective, or should I say the scary clown, ran like a madman across my front yard in the opposite direction, all the way limping and barely managing to go fast enough. This time, when the real cops knocked, I opened the door. The commotion had woken up my wife and son. I filled them in on what had happened. The cops told me that I was super smart not to open the door the second time when the fake cop showed up. They told us that the same thing had happened at different parts of the city, and that the scary clown or fake cop had even killed a woman who was naive enough to open the door. A citywide search was going on for this man, and the footage from our ring camera had helped the cops get the face of the criminal. Just a year later, we moved from Kansas to Montana, but the clown was never caught. But after that day, he didn't torment anyone else or loot any other houses. My overprotective attitude saved my family and many other families who could have been the victim after us. But that clown's face was the scariest thing I had ever caught on the ring camera. Ever. So next time, when someone rings your doorbell at night or knocks on your door, check before you open the door. Or you could become a victim of a scary criminal. Hello. My name is Elisa. I recently finished my college degree and graduated as what I always wanted to be, a librarian. When I was a child, my whole family was killed by a violent and brutal robbery at Christmas. The only reason I survived was because my parents hid me in time, and the robbers weren't very interested in finding me either. After that experience, I locked myself away in my parents' passion, books. While they were looking for families to adopt me, I was the quietest and most intelligent child at the foster care house. I read as many books as I could and whenever I could. What at first was a way to get closer to my parents also became my passion. Besides, I knew that if any family saw me reading, they would surely choose me. Eventually, I realized that I wasn't wrong, although I wish I had been. The White family was the one chosen to adopt me. They seemed nice enough, although I must admit they were very disciplined. Maybe that's why they were interested in me when they found out that I like to read. I hear everyone complaining about how difficult adoption is, and it surely is, but for people with as much money as the Whites, 
It wasn't. Before I could even begin to assimilate, I had to go through the adoption process. Before it could even begin to sink in that I was going to have a new family, they were already filling out the adoption papers. It scared me how quickly they did it. But at the time, I was thankful because I was sure I would have a secure future and a family to take me in. In the beginning, Adam and Miriam were very good parents. They were demanding, yes, but at the same time, they were very patient with my adjustment to this new life. Unfortunately, this did not last that long. The problem with many couples is that not all of them are ready to be parents, and they welcomed me so quickly they didn't even give themselves adequate time to assimilate. The Whites began to get bored with me, to regret adopting me. They became increasingly impatient with me. I didn't misbehave, not at all, but I made mistakes that were unacceptable to them, like doing the dishes wrong, not taking off my slippers when I entered the house, or not understanding a math exercise at the speed they would like. What started out as demanding parents soon turned to violent and abusive parents. The punishments were inhumane, and neither of them ever had any compassion for me. Eventually, I got used to it, but once in the library, it all came to a head. That day, Miriam felt a little guilty that her husband had left me without food all night. It was nothing she hadn't done before, but for some reason, that day, she felt bad about doing it. As a way of asking for my forgiveness, the next day she took me to the library, which her sister owned, and a few minutes before the library opened, my aunt left, leaving me alone with my mother to choose the book she wanted. Everything started out well. Miriam had many recommendations and seemed in a good mood. But from one moment to the next, everything changed. I accidentally dropped several books on the floor. It was no big deal. I quickly got up to pick them up. But at that moment, I noticed that something about her had changed. Furious, she told me that I had embarrassed her in her sister's library. That I shouldn't be so careless and that I had done it on purpose to ruin her day and that I was ungrateful for not appreciating the good gesture of bringing me here. Apologizing, very sorry for what I had done, I grabbed the books I already had and went to choose them at the table. I couldn't decide between the books, so I opened one to look inside. That was the worst mistake I could have made. Angry at how long it was taking, my adoptive mother closed the book violently and began to squeeze it, hurting my fingers in the process. With the bookcase empty, but not letting go of the book, she started yelling at me angrily, saying I was making fun of her. In reaction to what she had done to me, I started to cry. But this made her even angrier. Miriam covered my mouth with her hands and told me to stop screaming and that I was also doing it on purpose to make her look bad. Without finishing with me, she grabbed my hair while I tried not to cry so as not to make a noise to which she responded by throwing me off the table. As I stood up, still crying, she walked towards me slowly. Her eyes were red and she was shaking with anger. I had never seen her so angry. I stood still, ready to receive my punishment, until I noticed something else. She had her car keys in her hand, and she was holding it like a weapon. The keys had a sharp tip. Did she want to stick it in me? My body froze with fear, and my only reaction was to run, no matter the punishment, no matter what might come next. Miriam started to chase me all over the library, dodging all the tables and the shelves. Little by little, she ended up cornering me. I could see her clench the key in her hand. This was the end of me. Suddenly, I saw people running toward my adopted mother. It was my aunt and a library employee. They both stopped Miriam before she could do anything to me, and as they took her away, I fell down crying. As I cried, I could only hear her saying this was my fault. My aunt did not open the library for another hour, but as the staff began to arrive, they kicked my mother. 
My aunt took care of me for a while, and when she found out everything that had happened to me, she reported her sister and husband and asked social services if she could take care of me. That was the last time I saw them since my aunt also stopped talking to them. Something tells me that if my adoptive parents had wanted to, they could have kept me. But I feel that my aunt did them a big favor. Not that it hurt my feelings or anything, since she did that favor for me too. Have you ever seen something that you felt you should not have seen? Were you in the wrong place at the wrong time and felt you were the victim of something much bigger than yourself? That day, I had argued with my wife, and in an impulse act of anger, I walked down to the beach. But not the beach you know, full of people and voices of joy, but to the most deserted part of the beach, the part that was covered by huge caves that were not family friendly because children can get hurt. It was only eight o'clock in the morning and the day was quite cold and cloudy. Definitely not a day for the beach, but I didn't care. I put my feet on the sand and felt a little drizzle falling on me. I stood against a huge rock where a small roof was formed to protect me from the rain and watched as the small droplets hit the sea. I sat down and relaxed, stared at the immense sea in front of me. I relaxed and closed my eyes. I was still very sleepy. I just wanted to sleep a little more. When I woke up, I heard the rain falling on the beach. I could see the tide rising and my feet getting wet, but that was not what caught my attention. Surprised, I witnessed a person coming out of the sea and walking towards me. That person was not on the beach. He was not in the grottoes or on the shore. That person was coming from the bottom of the sea. He had started as a lump coming out of the sea, but as he came ashore, his body became more and more noticeable. Regardless of the waves hitting him, his pace was steady and precise. He was getting closer and closer to me. I wanted to run towards my van, but he was coming from that side and was already too close. I ran to the opposite side where he was, hiding behind all the rocks. Peeking out, I could see the being walking towards me slowly. The closer he got, the more I realized the mistake I was making. His body was huge. The strange being had no facial hair and its bluish skin was covered with scales. But the strangest thing was that it had no face. It had no eyes or mouth, but it still seemed to know where I was. The monster kept walking in my direction. It didn't hesitate or look for me. It knew perfectly where I was and was about to catch up with me. I hadn't realized it, but by hiding in the rocks, I had locked myself in. As the monster cornered me, I could see its muscles tighten. Whatever it had in front of it, it was ready to attack me. And if it grabbed me, I had no doubt it would not let me go. I thought about trying to dodge the huge monster. I thought about running past him and running as fast as I could to my truck, but I was sure he would catch up with me. Instead, I grabbed a huge stick I had next to me and in a fighting stance, waited for him. When I had him in front of me, I tried to hit him as hard as I could, but with one hand, he parried the blow, and with the other, he grabbed me by the neck and slammed me against the rock, then threw me into the sea. I was very dizzy, but I managed to gather my strength to get up and run. I thought I could escape from him, but this being moved very easily in the water, and in a matter of seconds, he caught up with me. He grabbed the back of my neck and dragged my face underwater. The ground was littered with small rocks that impacted my face, cutting it. Not satisfied with what he did to me, he lifted me out of the water and threw me back onto the beach. I took this opportunity to gather all of my strength and get up. I ran in the direction of my van, but I fell down. My body was too stiff and I was really very frightened. As I stood up, I turned around to see how far I was from the terrifying monster and to my surprise, it was right next to me. Almost effortlessly, the monster lifted me up by my hair and in midair gave me a punch in the face that sent me flying several meters backward. For a few minutes, I forgot about the monster, my family, everything. All I could think about was the intense and insufferable pain that ran through my body. My nose was broken and my face cramped. I made every effort to get up and keep running. 
the terrifying being kept walking as if nothing had happened. I made it to the van, and as soon as I got in, I realized how close the being was. He was no longer walking. He was running. The van wouldn't start, and crying, I watched as he got closer and closer. In my last attempt, when he was right beside me, the van started, and I accelerated as fast as I could. The engine was roaring as loud as it could, but the van only advanced a few meters and stopped. The monster was grabbing it from the back so hard that the van was totally immobilized. In response, I did the only thing I could think of at that time. I put the van in reverse and hit the monster, causing it to lose stability for a moment, which I took advantage of to accelerate and escape. As the van moved forward, I watched in the rearview mirror as the monster fell further and further behind until I lost sight of it. When I got home, I hugged my family in tears. I never talked about it, never told them what I saw. Maybe someday I will, but I'm not ready to. I don't know what that being was, and I don't need to know. Some things are better left at the bottom of the sea. My name is Austin Mitchell, and I'm an addict. Now, I know what you're probably thinking after hearing that. As I'm sure, images of the most common vices, for example, drugs and alcohol, just ran through your mind. But how I wish my addiction was that simple, as I'm an addict to something far worse than any other vices you may think of. There really isn't a word for this condition, as some doctors and psychologists, that I am an extreme adrenaline junkie. But I know it isn't an adrenaline rush that I'm looking for. What I'm really addicted to is seeing death. Now, I know this must be very strange to hear, but after hearing my story, you'll understand the reason behind my strange addiction. I've been dealing with death ever since I was a little kid. When I was 10, I remember pulling dangerous stunts like pole walking on the high jungle gym during recess. I did this just to see how far I could get before I fell. My strange antics just went up a notch from there, as when I was 12, I decided to jump out of my bedroom window just for the fun of it. These bizarre activities led me to break a lot of bones, and I was rushed to the ICU more than once. My parents and siblings all thought I was insane, as they all believed something was truly wrong with my head. But I didn't blame them, as I knew they couldn't see what I was seeing. As I grew older, I craved that dangerous feeling even more, as I started to do things that were even crazier. My friends at the time called me the ultimate daredevil, and it didn't take long before they saw my strange antics as a way to make a profit, because they eventually started filming them and uploading the videos online. These videos gained traction almost immediately, and it didn't take long before they all went viral. Most nights, I would read the comments under these videos, and I would see people saying things like, I can't believe this guy is crazy enough to constantly put his life at stake just for our own amusement and to get a couple of views. I always chuckled at comments like these because I knew deep down that I didn't care about the views. I truly did all these dangerous acts for my own thrill. It happened on the 16th of July, 2010. To increase the stakes, I decided to do something I had never done before as I made arrangements to swim with sharks. This was probably the most dangerous thing I had ever done and I wasn't sure if I was going to survive or not. My friends tried to talk me out of it as they said it was far too dangerous. But I told them that they shouldn't be worried as my goal wasn't to die, but to get so close to death that I could see her. They still tried to talk me out of it, but I had my mind made up and no one was going to change it. We made our way to New Smyrna Beach in Florida, a place that was notoriously known as the shark capital of the world. Numerous safety precautions were made as there was a safety boat nearby in case anything too deadly happened. The cameras were then set up and we began to wait. I still remember standing in the water with a huge smile on my face as the thrill I felt was amazing. An hour had quickly gone by and nothing had happened yet. I thoroughly enjoyed the suspense as I knew something dangerous was going to happen at any minute now. But the hours kept passing us by and nothing exciting had still happened. I could see the tension on the faces of my friends and the safety crew as they were all expectantly waiting for something to happen. But as the day went by, the tension turned into fatigue and it started to seem like no sharks were going to show up. It didn't take long before they told me that I should give up and try again tomorrow. But I didn't want to leave, and I was determined to see this through to the very end. I already knew it wasn't going to happen quickly, as I had done a lot of research on sharks. 
I knew these animals weren't ones to go out of their way to attack people, as the ISAF, International Shark Attack File, reported that it was more likely to be struck by lightning than be attacked by a shark. I knew the odds weren't in my favor, but I also knew that these animals had a crazy attraction to blood. So to speed things up, I asked for a pocket knife. They gave me the knife and I proceeded to give myself a little cut on the leg while standing in the water. I told myself that this was bound to attract at least one of them and I braced myself for it, but nothing happened. It was getting pretty late now and I had been in the water for too long. The safety team kept trying to convince me to take a break before I continued, but I didn't agree. They could tell my mind was set on this, so they decided to go back to shore and get something to eat. As the safety boat pulled away, I started to get a change of heart. My skin was completely wrinkled now, and I was also pretty hungry. I was finally about to give up when it happened. I instantly felt like my leg was in a shredder as I was fighting to drag underwater. I thrashed and struggled against it, but it was too strong. The safety team, who had noticed this, immediately started to make their way back to me but they were too far to reach me in time. The pain was unbearable and I started to scream, but it didn't take long before I stopped screaming as I found myself smiling. This was it. This was all I craved for, all I ever wanted. It was perfect. I stopped struggling now and I was about to give in when two strong arms pulled me out of the water. Spear guns were used to repel the shark and they quickly rushed me to the hospital. Luckily, the shark wasn't able to take my entire leg off, but I was left with 48 stitches for the 24 cuts I had received. This incident shook my friends as we were told that I was lucky to be alive. After that, they all decided to stop the videos in the extreme daredevil stunts as they realized that I could have actually died that day. But all I could really think about was the next life-threatening situation I was going to put myself in. I was always prepared to die as I knew it was bound to happen sooner rather than later. I also knew that even if they stopped filming me, I would continue doing my dangerous stunts to keep chasing that thrill. This was the only way I could come face to face with death. And I know I'll give anything to see her beautiful pale face once again. Hi, I'm Jackson Robinson. I'm 28 years old right now, but... When I was a teenager, I used to live in a small coastal town with my family. Now I live in a big city, but my parents are still there. I had a group of friends back home. We had all grown up together and loved to drive around town and go out to the beach often. However, a few miles away from our small town, there was a super secluded beach. Only the locals knew about this beach. None of the tourists who visited our town knew about this particular one. Neither did any local tell them about it. And if by chance any tourist ever stumbled upon this beach, the locals made sure that the tourist leaves the beach as soon as possible. Now, you must be wondering why no one was allowed to go to this beach. In fact, it was the most beautiful beach in town, with clear water and white sand. The reason was that the townspeople believed that this beach was haunted. Now, growing up, I was a believer. I was a scared kid, and the slightest thing would scare me. So, when my parents told me never to visit this beach, I obeyed them. Hell, I never even spoke about this beach as a kid. But when I entered my teenage years, my fears evaporated with my cigarette smoke. I'd somehow become a daredevil after living an extremely shy and sheltered life. I used to smoke, drink, and even do some substances. Not my best moment to look back on, but I was a wild child. I drove a Mustang that my dad had gifted me for my 16th birthday and partied all over town. I had three best friends, Rocky, Adam, and Sam. We were always together, our little gang. Everything about our friendship was perfect, but we loved to give each other stupid dares. Now as a 16 or 17 year old, the worst dare you can give your friend is to get booze from a shop or to go talk to the super popular girl in class. And for a long while, we did just that until the day when Sam asked me to go to the Forbidden Beach as a dare. He told me that if I did that, he would give me his month's allowance. We all knew Sam was loaded, so for his allowance, I agreed to go there. We decided that I would go there on a Saturday night as we didn't have school the next day. However, before doing this, I was super anxious. 
Obviously, in order to appear strong and unfazed, I put up a brave face. But all these haunted stories my parents had told me as a child were replaying in the back of my mind. I knew I wasn't going to back down, but I wasn't sure I would be brave enough to do it either. Hey, just to make sure you actually visit the beach, you have to click your photo next to the warning board there, so we know you did it, Rocky said, and everyone agreed to it. This meant I had no way around it. I had to do this and prove that I was brave enough. On Saturday evening, my friends decided that they would drive halfway with me and wait for me to return. They did this to make me feel a little bit safe, but the end goal was still scary. Nevertheless, a dare was a dare, and Sam's allowance was on the line. At around 11 in the night, I snuck out of the house and met my friends. From there, Rocky, Adam, and Sam got into Sam's car, and I was driving mine alone. Halfway to the beach, I saw their car slowing down to a stop on the way from my side mirror. You're on your own now, buddy, I said to myself. My plan was clear, to get out of the car, click a picture near the board, get back in the car, and drive back as fast and as quickly as possible. However, as I was getting near the beach, I felt my resolve crumble. Finally, I reached the beach and spotted the warning board at a distance. The water wasn't calm as it was a low tide. I parked my car, grabbed my keys, and got out. I had to walk a few yards through the sand to get to that board. Instead of looking anywhere, I focused on my path. Every step took me closer to the board. I fetched my phone out of my pants pocket and opened up the camera app. Back then, the button phones weren't as user-friendly as our touchscreens are now. But I still managed to take a selfie. I was smiling wide in the picture as I didn't want to appear scared. I made sure the picture was clear enough and then started running through the sand back to my car. My main mission was over now. I just had to get my ass back home safely. The minute my feet hit the pavement, I yanked the driver's side door open and got in my car. Just getting inside my car made me feel a lot safer. Now I just had to start my car. I reached into my pocket to grab my keys, ready to leave this place and never look back. But, unfortunately, the keys fell out of my hand and dropped near my feet. It was dark in the car, so I knew it would be difficult to find them. The minute I bent down to find the keys, someone banged loudly on my window. I was so shocked that I immediately looked up. Beside my car was a filthy-looking old man whose face was all wrinkled and scary. His teeth were missing, and his eyes were hollow and red. I was so terrified that I tried to start the car, but then realized the keys were still down. This man was constantly banging on the glass window and the door. I, on the other hand, was struggling to find my keys. That's when he grabbed the door handle and started pulling on it. Open the door. Let me in. He said in a weird, deep, and demonic voice. Open the door! Open it! He kept yelling. That's when I found my keys and started the car. I thought now I would leave this man behind and go. Home was all I was thinking about as I hit the gas. Instantly, my car was running down the road. However, when I looked through my window, that man was running parallel to my car, as fast as the speed I was driving. Now his face had morphed into something totally demonic. It gives me chills to even remember it. The more I increased the speed, the faster it ran. I knew this was something paranormal. So instead of being scared, I just drove my car as fast as I could and started praying. The moment I started praying, the thing disappeared and in minutes I was parked outside of my house. I snuck back into my room and had a sleepless night. In the morning, I was very sick. I had a fever and a severe headache. I was in no mood to show the picture to my friends or to get my money. This fever continued for a week, after which I was finally all right. A week later, I text Rocky saying that I had completed the dare, but I got no reply. In fact, none of my friends had contacted me all week, which was strange. 
So I visited Rocky, and he too had a fever and a severe headache. From him, I got to know that Sam and Adam were sick as well. But that wasn't the weird part. When I spoke to Rocky, he told me that when I was driving back home, they were still waiting for me in that same spot. They saw my car pass by, but that wasn't the only thing they saw. They had also seen the old shriveled man run parallel to my car at an unnatural speed. This meant that what I had experienced was indeed a paranormal experience, and it wasn't all in my head. After that, I never went back to that beach, as it is indeed a haunted beach. When I was a teenager, I used to work in our town's local library. That library was the largest in the county, and not only did the town's people go there, but so did the students of the local university. The library had all types of books. You name it, and the book was available for you. However, after 2013, the library shifted from the old building to a new location. That new location was a former furniture store. Unfortunately, only the books and staff were relocated, not the bookshelves or our book sorting belt. The move was stressful, not only on the management and staff, but also on the patrons. Not being able to find a certain book, small arguments with the patrons, and so on, had become a common occurrence after the move, and we knew it would stay the same way until we settled into the new place. We had a mother-daughter duo in our staff. Both of them were tasked with sorting the books and making sure the books were as accessible to the public as best they could without having the shelves. In order to speed up the process, we all had to work overtime, which meant we would spend long hours at the library after it closed. Plus, the books, other record books, and DVDs were stored upstairs on the second-story floor, which at that time was used as a storage area and was inaccessible to the patrons. We eventually planned to open the second floor for patrons, too. Whenever we worked overtime, the mother-daughter duo would claim that they saw a ghostly apparition. They referred to him as the man whenever anyone asked them about the ghost. They used to say that he looked like a man and that they would spot him in all the corners of the library and even behind the shelves and whatnot. I never truly believed in their stories and neither did any of the other staff members, because no one, except them, had seen the man, and no one had experienced anything weird there. For God's sake, it was a furniture store. What could be haunted about a furniture store? Our manager, on the other hand, always made sure that Maya and Myra, the mother and daughter duo, were comfortable. He also took measures to make sure no one outside of the library knew anything about the man for fear that it would put the library out of business. Maya and Myra were cowardly and so scared that they never went to the upper floor alone. They always took another staff member with them if they had to stock any books upstairs. Their behavior frustrated the other staff members, but everyone still helped them. One evening, the library was particularly understaffed. Other than a handful of staff members, no one was there. Maya and Myra were there too. We were all stocking and sorting the books as usual when suddenly, Maya who was working in the back of the library, started yelling. Almost all the staff members, including me, ran there to see Maya on the ground. She was extremely scared. Her eyes were wide, and she was crouched in a corner and was pointing towards the corner opposite her. 
What happened, Maya? I asked her. Even Myra, her daughter, was beside her at the time. <laughs> I saw the man. He tried to attack me. She was breathing heavily. I and Myra helped her sit on a table and offered her water. But still, Maya was looking at the corner where she spotted the man. I think you should take her home, I told Myra. And a little later, they left. A couple of days later, during a shift, Maya was again shouting and screaming, saying that the man was going to kill her. That behavior continued for over a month before the manager had to let go of the mother-daughter duo because Maya's behavior was not beneficial for the library. But I always wondered why only she and her daughter could see the man. Why did no one else see him? Or was the man even a real thing? But we were so overworked in the library, no one had a minute to spare to think about Maya and Myra. A few days later, news arrived that Maya had hung herself in her room, and Myra was going to be taken away by Child Protective Services because she was only 16. Everyone in the library wanted to know what had provoked such a strong reaction from Maya. One of the staff members who lived near Maya told us what had really happened. Maya's husband, who was Myra's dad, was an abusive man. He used to verbally and physically abuse both of them. That might have triggered her fear. Maybe there was no ghost, called the man. Maybe it was all in her head. Maybe the fear of her husband was manifesting as the man. However, I still had a feeling that there was more to the story. Even though there was a good chance that Myra was mentally unstable due to the abuse she faced, a part of me thought there might be something we were missing. So, to dig into the matter even more, I decided to revisit the history of the place. In the library, there were archives of the town's history. As I dug through one of them, I found out that the library shared the same wall as the town's jail, which had shut down in the late 1970s. The upper floor of our library was right beside the execution room of that jail, and a lot of criminals were executed in that room. Although there was no known report of any paranormal event or haunting in that closed jail, I thought maybe something paranormal was going on. So I decided to call up an expert who I found online. His name was Harrison, and he was a paranormal investigator. I called him there to take a look at the library. Harrison arrived and asked, Has anything tragic happened in this place? No, nothing that I know of, but a jail's execution room used to be next to the upper floor of the library. Hmm, I sense dark energy here, but it is very weak and has no power to do any considerable damage to anyone. Did any of you experience anything paranormal here? I told Harrison all about Myra and Maya, and how she had hung herself. After hearing my story, Harrison told me what might have happened. You see, the ghostly apparition, the man, is the dark spirit living in this space. It could be the spirit of a criminal who was killed in jail. Maya was a sensitive and vulnerable person. She became an easy victim of this spirit. Maybe her emotional trauma, combined with the fear of the evil spirit, forced her to kill herself. Anyway, I can perform a cleansing ritual for the library, to keep the spirit away. So henceforth, no other person will fall prey to it. He performed the ritual, and I could instantly feel a little lighter there. It felt like all the dark corners of the library had been brightened. Later that year, I stopped working in the library and moved to another town. The only regret I had was not being able to help Myra sooner. Maybe if I would have helped her, I could have saved her life.
as a hotel receptionist, I get to meet a lot of people. For the most part, it's an easy job, unlike being into room service or the kitchen. A receptionist's job is straightforward. However, that does not mean we do not deal with our fair share of crazy customers. However, the story I'm about to tell you was the most bizarre and horrifying thing that had ever happened on my shift. So the hotel I work at is a five-star hotel, including its own restaurant and whatnot. But it's also said to be the most haunted hotel in town. Now, being a receptionist, I have never experienced anything remotely paranormal in this place until this incident. Many of the staff members, especially the room service people, claim to have experienced a few things. Nothing major or life-threatening, but they have heard footsteps, felt like someone is watching them. They have heard weird noises and stuff like that. But now, most of the staff is desensitized to these things. We just do our job and move on. The hotel had seven floors and a big rooftop to host events. The fourth floor had suites just like most of the other floors. Our hotel has two big elevators that go right from the basement to the rooftop. The staff, as well as customers, use these elevators. Each elevator has a CCTV camera in it that records who uses the lift at all times. One evening, I got a call from suite number 606. Hello, you have reached the reception. How may I help you? I ask. The water from the shower is brownish. Why is it that way? Can you do something about it? Hmm... This was the first time someone had made that complaint. Surely there must be something malfunctioning. Don't worry, ma'am. Please tell me your room number and I will ask someone to take a look. I hung up with her call and then asked a staff member to take a look. They checked the plumbing and there was no issue with it. Everything seemed fine. No rust or leaks or breaks in the pipe for dirt to get into the water. So, similar complaints started flooding in. Many guests living in different suites were complaining about the bad water quality in the bathroom. Now, you must know hotels this big spend a good portion of their revenue each year on water purification and filtering, so this was a very unlikely scenario. When the plumbers could not detect the source of the brown water, they decided to do a more extensive search. Instead of checking the pipes, they decided to check in the big water tanks that hold the water. These tanks were situated in a secluded area on the rooftop, which is locked at all times. A few staff members accompanied these plumbers to the rooftops, and they began checking the outside of the tank first. When they found nothing out of the ordinary, they called, having decided to open the water tank, which is locked. The moment they opened the tank, the plumber who was going to check it from inside screamed and fell from the ladder he had used to get to the top of the tank. The rest of the people with him were confused. Soon the cops were called, and all the guests staying in the hotel were either moved to another hotel or asked not to use the shower and the bathroom at all. Exactly four days before this incident on January 22, 2020, Maria Lee had checked in for four days. I was the one who checked her in. Like most receptionists, I do not remember the name or faces of all the people who check in or check out, but I remember checking in Maria just because she was the only Asian woman in the lobby that evening. Maria was very friendly, and it was her first time staying in our hotel. She was staying there alone and was expecting no company for the duration of her stay. She seemed like any normal guest you see living in a hotel. Whenever any of our guests experienced something slightly weird, or should I say paranormal, their first reaction is to either call reception or try to find a staff member as soon as possible. So when Maria's swollen dead body was found floating face first in the big water tank on the roof, there were a lot of questions in the minds of the authorities as well as the staff members. As there were no calls made from her room to the reception, neither had any staff member seen her going towards the rooftop. Everyone was wondering how she got there. More so, when the tank was locked at all times, except while conducting regular maintenance. The reason for the brown water was her dead body which was leaking bodily fluids into the water in the tank. But discovering her dead body wasn't the scariest part. The scariest part was the things that were revealed during the investigation. Initially, all of the staff members, including me, were called in for questioning who had worked in the hotel during Maria's stay there. When the cops found no leads, 
they decided to check all the CCTV cameras in the hotel. Not much was found on the CCTV camera installed in the corridors or the main lobby, but the CCTV in the elevator had some solid footage. Many staff members had complained for ages that the elevator was probably the most haunted part of the hotel. In the CCTV footage, you could clearly see Maria entering the elevator on the fourth floor. She looks visibly scared and a lot shifty. She's in her pajamas and her hair open and barefoot. This was odd. When she got in the elevator, unlike normal people who press the floor they want to go to, Maria kept staring at the buttons for a few seconds. Then she pressed the button to the seventh floor. Suddenly, as the door to the elevator was about to close, she hid behind a metal panel as if someone was after her. She was terrified, judging by the expression on her face. When the elevator doors closed completely, she started staring at her own reflection in the mirror. Suddenly, she crouched down in one corner as if she had seen something terrifying in the mirror. When the elevator reached the seventh floor, as soon as the doors opened, she ran out of the elevator. She was captured by the CCTV cameras on the seventh floor, but that was the last time she was recorded. No camera had recorded her going to the rooftop, let alone the water tank. And then, her dead body was found. The forensics predicted that Maria died on the 23rd, which means a day after her arrival. To date, the case is open, and no one knows how Maria died, or what she was scared of and running away from. And the worst part was, how did she get into the locked water tank on the rooftop? Not even the best detectives were able to solve the case. However, some staff members who have worked in the hotel for over a decade say that this was done by the spirits that haunt the hotel. On the one hand, I personally do not believe anyone who says the evil spirits did it. But, on the other hand, there is no logical explanation as to how she might have died. Every day I work in this hotel, I keep wondering, what must have happened to Maria Lee? Last night, something extremely weird and scary happened. My friends and I still have no idea how to make sense of it. It was as if we were in a horror story. So, just like every month, me and my buddies, Chris, Noel, Nick, and Asha, were in our regular Tim Hortons for dinner. We all work really tough jobs. I'm a civil engineer, so I'm all the time either on construction sites or in my office. Nick is a writer, so he's either working on his book or brainstorming ideas for his next one. Noel works in a car company, so he's traveling the world making deals and signing contracts. Asha is a professor and had lectures to teach and papers to grade. Still, on every month's second Saturday, we meet at this particular Tim Horton for dinner. We usually share whatever is going on in our life and just chat and chill out. Most of the staff members know us as their regulars, but this time, there was a new waiter there. He was a bit odd. For starters, he wasn't very attentive. Nick had to call him and wave at him a couple of times to get his attention. When he finally arrived at our table for a few minutes, he didn't write down our orders. Then, when he did, Chris had to make sure that all our orders were properly written. Seems like this guy is either drunk or high, Nick said. We laughed it off. A few minutes later, the waiter brought us our beers, and luckily, the order was correct. Later, we wanted our water to be refilled, and Chris tried to get the waiter's attention, but he looked right over us, and not at us. Dude... It's difficult to get this guy's attention. What the hell is wrong with him? Asha said. I'm telling you, he's high on something. Otherwise, who would act like that? Nick said. Finally, the waiter arrived with water, but spilled some on Nick's lap. Hey, what the hell, dude? Be a little careful. I don't want a wet spot on my pants. People might think I peed myself or something. Nick said with a serious face, fed up with the waiter but the rest of us just laughed out loud. The waiter just said sorry and moved ahead. This continues for the rest of our time there. We try to get the waiter's attention and he walks right past our table without so much as acknowledging us. It was all a big joke and Asha was planning to write a one-star review to the Tim Hortons. Finally, our food arrived, although the order was perfect. 
he just placed the wrong food items in front of us. Instead of pointing it out, we just laughed some more and then made sure each of us had their ordered food. Thereafter, instead of giving his order for our beer, we just started telling him to surprise us, and each time he used to get us the same beer we had ordered initially. He was still in a daze as if there was a fog in his brain instead of actual working brain cells. This was definitely going to be a memorable dinner we would often joke about henceforth. When we were ready to pay, a waitress walked up to our table with our bill and apologized for the tardiness of the waiter earlier. We assured her it was no big deal, and Asha even dropped the idea of writing a negative review. She also told us that the previous waiter had fondly taken his much-needed break and was out in the back. Finally, we paid the bill and walked out of the restaurant, still cracking jokes about the waiter and how Nick would have looked if the waiter would have spilled the water in his lap. I had picked up the guys from their homes and was responsible for dropping them off. That's why I only drank two beers. However, I had parked my car in the parking lot behind the Tim Hortons. As we all headed there, still laughing and joking, Asha stops in her tracks and stares to her right, straight at something. Noel was the first one to spot him. What are you looking at? Asha asked. Look there. He points right at the back door of the restaurant we just exited. It's dark out there, only two streetlights at the two extreme ends of the parking lot. However, there's hardly any light illuminating the back door of the restaurant. So when Asha asked us to look carefully, we all stopped and looked towards the door. That's when we saw it. The most disturbing view of our life. It was weird that people watch disturbing things in a hospital when people die or in movies. And we were all looking at it behind a damn Tim Hortons. Is it real or am I dreaming? Nick asked in an utterly serious tone. I think it's real, Chris confirmed. I think so too, I said. That's when it sees, or should I say he, sees us. We're rooted to our spot when our eyes lock and no one from the group has the strength or the courage to move. Then he moves and takes a step away from the door. That's when our fight-or-flight instincts kick in, and we all started sprinting towards my car. I already had the keys in my hand, and as soon as I reached the car, I unlocked it and got behind the wheel. My friends, too, piled up into the car and slammed the door shut, locking them. I started the car and began driving, the headlights illuminating the road. I drove the car at full speed as my friends huddled in the back and passenger seat beside me. All the buzz they were feeling from the beer they had drank drained out of them. I was soon on the main street connecting to the highway, going towards my home. For several minutes, none of us said a word. We were all shocked, and I focused on driving. Was it true? Noel asked, and instead of answering him, we all just nodded. We reached my home and I asked everyone to stay the night, and none of them complained. I live in a big apartment, and... I didn't sleep until the wee hours. Today, when I walked out of my room, all my friends were sitting around my coffee table, just staring straight at the TV, which was showing some news. However, when I read the news, the ground beneath my body shook. The news report said that a person's dead body was found in a parking lot behind a Tim Hortons restaurant this morning, the exact Tim Hortons we had dinner at last night. The dead body was missing some vital organs, like the heart, the kidneys, and the liver. It was suspected that it was an animal attack, but this restaurant is in the middle of the city, so there's no chance of it being an animal attack, as the largest animals we have are dogs, who just bite if they need to, not to eat your selective organs. The news stated that some detectives claimed it was done by a person, but most of the cops had dismissed the theory, claiming who would be so gruesome. The dead person was a waiter who worked at Tim Hortons itself. The poor fellow must have come out of the back door for his break and fallen prey to whatever it was. The whole media, cops, and detectives were baffled by the case. They also say that whoever did this is still roaming the streets. Once the news shifts to another topic, we all look at each other, wondering what to do. Because last night, we saw this poor person being killed when we stopped in the parking lot and looked at the back door. We had seen a person on all fours eating this dead waiter. 
We couldn't believe our eyes. When we registered what we were seeing, the man on all fours saw us and then got up. He was standing on his two legs now, but his face was red from the blood of the dead man he had just eaten. When we looked a bit more clearly, we noticed that the horrifying-looking man was none other than the weird waiter who had served us tonight. The moment he registered us, staring at him, he began running at us, and we ran. And you know how the rest goes from there. We're not sure what to make of it, but we certainly know that the waiter was the one who had killed and eaten his poor colleague. Should we report to the cops, or should we forget last night and move on with our lives? And more importantly, what was this waiter? Was he a demon, or an animal? I do not want to reveal my name or my whereabouts, but I wish to share this story with you, as I believe it's important for people to know it. For the sake of this story, I'm going to use fake names for all the characters, including mine, except one. I still remember the first time I went on a date. I had just turned 20 and my parents were okay with me dating. My friend Sally knew a guy from her dad's workplace she thought would be perfect for me. I had not met this guy before so it was like a blind date for me. I was excited and fussed about my dress and hair for almost a week before the date. As this was a blind date, instead of me contacting the guy, Sally had informed me that the guy would meet me at Tim Horton's on Saturday. My parents and my brother are very protective of me, so it was decided that my brother would drop me off at the restaurant for the date. Back then there were no cell phones, just some payphones. Before I got out of the car that afternoon, my brother said, Hey, if you want me to bring you home anytime, just call home and I'll be there to pick you up in no time. Sure, but I don't think that would be necessary, as I plan on enjoying my first date to the fullest. I was messing with my brother considering how protective he was. A few minutes later, I was sitting in front of a handsome and charming man. He was wearing a brown jacket with a white shirt underneath it paired with black pants. The moment I saw him, I was puzzled why he would want to go on a date with little old me. He was a few years older than me and extremely good looking. He could have any woman in the town if he wanted, but he had chosen me. Is this a blind date for you too? I asked. He chuckled a bit and said, <laughs> Honestly, no. I had seen you hanging out with Sally a couple of times, and I asked her to fix this date so I could take you out. That was a surprise that he had specifically wanted to go out with me. But I let it go and decided to get to know that man more. So, what do you do? I'm working part-time at the wood shop Sally's family owns. What about you? I just graduated and plan on going to college a year later. Till then, I'm just enjoying my break. Hmm. That sounds fun. Should we order now? Sure. I'd like a chicken burger and a chocolate milkshake, I said, and he read the menu and ordered a sandwich for himself. We got along pretty well. He was as funny as he was handsome, and I thought about how well my first date was going. I was going to thank Sally after I got home and tell her all about the date. While we were having our food and talking, my date suddenly mentioned a few facts about me that only a handful of close people knew, and I was sure that Sally would not have told him all of it. It seemed like a red flag to me, but I tried convincing myself that it was okay. But as the time passed, I could not shake it off. The fact that he might have followed me or stalked me, all those things seemed very creepy. He noticed my unease and my reluctance to talk as freely as I was talking before, 
and I was sure he knew what had made me so uncomfortable. Slowly, he too lost interest in our date, and we both ate our food quietly. However, instead of focusing on the food, he was staring at me weirdly. His handsome face had conjured into something sinister. That's when I felt the cold metal against my thigh. At first I thought it was the table, but when the cold metal was dragged against my thigh, I understood what it was. The panic in my eyes were evident. Don't you dare scream or yell. Do as I say, and nothing bad will happen to anyone. My date said to me, with a very charming but very fake smile. For a second, I just froze, unable to focus on anything. Just sitting there staring at my plate and contemplating how I got myself in this situation. He kept on dragging the knife against my thighs, the sharp side making contact with my skin. I knew if I even moved an inch, it would pierce my skin. That's when the waitress interrupted us, asking if we needed anything. No thanks, we are good, my date replied on our behalf. I knew I had to bail out of this date before it got too far, and that was probably my only chance. Excuse me, miss. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to know where the restroom is, I asked the waitress just as she was about to leave. Maybe she saw the panic in my eyes, too and asked me to walk with her so she could guide me to it. I excused myself to go to the restroom. I knew he wouldn't harm me while someone was present. Instead of going to the restroom, I asked the waitress to take me to the payphone so that I could call my brother. Hey, George, could you please come get me? I'm hiding in the women's restroom in the Tim Hortons. Listening to the terror in my voice, I knew he was on high alert. I could hear him grab his keys on the other end. I quietly waited in the last stall until I heard my brother's voice out of the restroom calling for me. I quietly waited in the last stall till I heard my brother's voice out of the restroom calling for me. I rushed to him and we left the restaurant and we drove back home. I told him all about the date of mine. Relax, Audrey. I've got you now. Forget about that date. You're safe. The next morning, around 4 a.m., when my brother was leaving the house for his paper route, he heard some rustling in a bush beside our main door. He did not have a gun, but he quickly grabbed his baseball bat to tackle whatever was in there. Mostly, it was usually a raccoon or some rodent. However, this time a grown man stood up behind the bush and started running into the road the opposite direction. That startled my brother and, instead of chasing the man, he ran inside and woke me and our parents up. We all were pretty confused as to what had happened, and everyone was asking my brother questions about the incident. My dad asked him to describe the man, and what he said cracked the floor open beneath my feet. He was tall, had fair skin, had wavy hair, and wore a brown jacket and black pants. He had just described my date. I just stood there shocked. I guess that was my date from yesterday. Hearing that, my parents and brothers were extremely worried too. Although we did not report the incident, as there wasn't much to report anyways, we did keep an eye out for the young man. It was clear by then that he wanted to hurt me, so for the next few days, we made sure that I wouldn't go out alone. Three years had passed, and I was in a happy relationship with my current boyfriend at the time, Marco when one evening we were chilling in my home's living room. We saw the news. It was about the murder of a few women, and the serial killer who killed them. 
The moment I looked at the face of the man on the news, the cup of coffee from my hand dropped to the ground and broke. For a few seconds, I was rendered speechless and just stared at the screen. My brother and father were also watching the news with me and Marco. George, that's the guy. The, the, the guy I went on a date with all those years ago. The one who stalked me. Good God, I feel so relieved that you decided to walk away from that man. The news said that he had sexually assaulted a couple of women and killed them. I cried and thanked the heavens for saving me from the predator. According to the news reporter, the killer's name was Ted Bundy. My name is Anthony Smith, and I was an employee at the Burger King restaurant in Houston, Texas. My reason for writing this is to share with the public the horrific activities that have occurred at Burger King for the past couple of years involving the disappearance of multiple Burger King employees with no information as to where they had gone and my personal traumatic experience with the infamous Burger King. I interviewed for the job at Burger King on the 21st of November, 2017. At the time, I was 21 years old and just looking for a way to get some money while I looked for a better job. The man who interviewed me was named Donald, and since the job didn't require any past experience or anything like that, it was more him giving me the restaurant's rules and guidelines than actually asking me questions. The rule he emphasized the most was kind of odd to me. He made sure I understood the manager and manager's office were strictly off limits and any issues I had should be taken up with him, the assistant manager, as the manager was a very private man and did not like to be disturbed. Now, it seemed odd to me that the manager wouldn't want to interact with the employees at all, but it didn't seem like a problem at the time and I was just glad I had gotten the job. The first few weeks working at Burger King were tiring. I was constantly doing dishes all day, and at night, when I was done with the dishes, I'd have to clean the whole place alone. I wasn't sure if I'd keep the job for much longer, but I did because I needed the money. Eventually, I got used to the routine, and I began bonding with the cooks and a girl named Becky, who always stayed late to lock up. While cooking at night, I couldn't help but always glance at the manager's door and wonder how no one had seen him or if he even cared what went on in the restaurant. One day, while doing the dishes, I decided to ask the cooks if any of them ever met the manager. Hey, this is kind of a weird question, but have any of you ever met the manager? A silence followed before Gerald, the head chef, looked at me and said, Well, I haven't met him, but I've seen him. The silence remained as Gerald continued with, It was back when I was still kind of new here. I was working the night shift when I heard his door shut. Obviously, I wanted to know what he looked like, so I stopped and had a look. Gerald paused as if trying to build up the tension. He laughed and continued. <laughs> I've told everyone already, he's a pretty normal guy. There's no mystery. There's no secret. Just a man that likes his privacy, so don't go looking for answers where there are no questions, Smith. He patted me on the back and walked away. We were open pretty late that night, but eventually everyone had gone home, and the only one I was left with was Becky. I decided to ask her about the manager as I couldn't believe Gerald's story. Can I ask you something? I asked as I cleaned down the last table. Whatever you want, Smith. She replied, so I continued with, What do you think about our manager? I stopped cleaning and looked at her, trying to see if she had any reaction like the cooks. But... She didn't seem even slightly bothered by my question. She just looked up at me and said, You mean the manager that doesn't exist? Honestly, I've never cared enough to ask questions. I just get paid and go home. I responded with, So you didn't find it even slightly strange? What if it's something illegal? She laughed and kept looking at her phone. Yeah, sure, Smith. Maybe Burger King is a drug lab or a... She was cut off by the sound of a shutting door coming from the back. Nobody else was with us, and the only offices at the back were Donald's and the manager's. Did you hear that? I said, wondering who was around this late. Becky didn't seem to care as she just replied, Relax! It's probably just Donald. He stays late sometimes. I was basically done cleaning, so I decided to check it out. 
I walked out to the back and no one was there. So I decided it'd be better to just finish up and leave. I didn't see Donald, I said as I returned to the dining area. It's cool. I saw who it was. Becky said, still clearly unbothered. Really? Who was it? I asked. We were both pretty tired and I figured I was keeping Becky by wasting time, so I told her I was done and left her to lock up. That night in bed, I thought for a while about what both Gerald and Becky said and decided whoever the manager was, I shouldn't care as long as I did my job and got paid. As I walked to Burger King the next morning, I could see a small crowd forming around the restaurant and a couple of cop cars and police officers trying to disperse the crowd, a lot of which were Burger King employees. I figured someone had broken in and stolen something, but, but as I got closer, I realized the truth was far more worse than that. My heart fell to my stomach as I saw Becky sighted up against the door with her head tilted over. There was a large amount of blood on her head and some had run down her arms and face. The police questioned all the employees on their whereabouts last night and eventually it came up that I was the last person to see Becky alive so I was taken into custody to be questioned. I told the police everything about how Becky and I usually stayed late together every night and this wasn't a one-time thing. They asked me to think hard as even the smallest detail could be the answer to this question and it didn't take that much thinking to remember the only thing I found odd last night. There was a noise, I said. A noise? The officer replied as that detail seemed to have interested him. Yeah, a noise. It came from the back. The officer interrupted with, The back like, out back? No, I replied. Not outside. It's where the offices and stores are. At least, that's what I thought. But when I went to check it out, no one was there. I continued with, Becky said she saw someone though. The officer's eyes lit up when I said that. Did she say who it was? No. All she said was he was really tall. That's it. The officer said, visibly disappointed. Nothing else. He continued. Listen, young man, we understand you're probably very emotional right now, and we get it. But a young lady was killed right in front of your workplace. Nothing was stolen, and she wasn't sexually assaulted. Do you understand what that means? It means either your friend Becky kept some bad company, or we have a very sick individual running around killing people. So if there's anything you're keeping from us, I suggest you say it. To be honest, I was trying to understand what had happened just as much as the police wanted to, and I don't know why, but I was certain the manager had something to do with Becky's death. I told the police I didn't know anything else, and after some more questions, they let me go. I was told not to travel out of the city and that I would be contacted again shortly. I didn't think I would be a suspect, but it made sense seeing I was the last person to see her alive. I thought about what to do for a while. I was already the leading suspect in this case and would be prosecuted if the police didn't find the actual killers or any evidence proving otherwise. I thought hard and back to that night, wondering if I had missed anything. All I could remember was the noise of the shutting door. It didn't make any sense how whoever it was left without me seeing them. I laid in bed thinking for hours before deciding I had to find out for myself what really happened that night. I walked over to Burger King at night with only one thing on my mind. Who was the tall man Becky saw? It wasn't hard getting past the police tape and getting in through the back door. The place was quiet. I couldn't help but notice how being in here alone filled the Burger King with an eerie feeling. I silenced my phone and lowered the brightness before walking straight over to where the offices were. And standing in front of the manager's office, sort of preparing myself for a reveal of some sort, I got the sense of tension as chills ran down my spine. I opened the door, and almost immediately something caught my eye. It was a door right at the back of his office. A door, I'm guessing, leads outside. It seemed to explain everything, but I couldn't help but still feel confused. I decided to look around the office and see if I'd find answers. It was quite a small office. It had a lot of paperwork and didn't have anything out of place. I figured the door was enough to prove the manager had something to do with Becky's death and would eventually help the cops figure out the rest of the story. But as I was about to leave, I heard something faint, but it got louder and I soon realized they were footsteps. I quickly turned my phone's flashlight off 
and hid under the desk right when the door slowly creaked open. The person walked into the room and there was silence for a minute. Fear was the only thing I could feel at that moment as I wondered if I would end up like Becky. There was no movement or sound, almost like whoever it was simply stood in the room with me. But then he said, You can choose to remain hidden, but the outcome won't be any different, Smith. His voice cut through the silence, but I remained quiet. He sounded old. I'd figured you'd be more enthusiastic than this when you finally got to meet me. Don't you want answers to your questions? I decided at this point, he obviously knew I was in the room, so there was no point hiding. I hit emergency call on my phone, slipped it in my pocket, and got out from under the table. I was met with an almost seven feet tall man, completely bald with huge eyes that had completely sagged eye bags under them. He had a slight hunch forward and was skinny. You knew I'd come? I was wondering how he found out I was here. Yes, you aren't a very smart individual. He replied with no expression on his face. Why do you kill her? I asked, hoping the cops would get here before he killed me too. No, I didn't kill her, Smith. You did. He said, pointing at me. What? No, I didn't. Yes, you did. He screamed, interrupting me. You killed her, Smith. Your questions killed her. You couldn't just work like everyone else, could you? Well, that's what killed her. You know, someone like you always comes around eventually, asking questions they're not meant to. Far too inquisitive for their own good. And then, we have to kill them. I was both scared and confused at this point. Was he killing people for just trying to find out who he was and... What did he mean by we? What kind of sick man kills people because they want to know what he looks like? I took a few steps back after asking the question, as I didn't know if I would be getting a reply, he would just get bored and kill me. Look, Smith, a long time ago, probably before you could even say a word, I was part of a greater mission to keep the world how it is. To be rid of all the purges and mistakes on this earth. I was a member of the second clan of the KKK, a group with only one goal, to cleanse the world. But instead, we were seen as evil by this weak society and deemed belittling names such as white supremacists and hate groups. Unfortunately, I was arrested and put on death row. That was until some members of my clan broke me out, of course. We had to leave our home, but don't be mistaken. We took our mission with us. I am a very wanted man, and where better to hide than the place this society sees as a safe place, he continued. Do you understand, Smith? People like you are a risk to me and my clan as a whole. We tried to warn you not to ask questions, but you blatantly disregarded our warning. The sickening look in his eyes couldn't be described, but I knew he was going to kill me. I didn't want to die, so I asked one last question as my final attempt to buy time. But why Becky? I asked, crying. He wore a sickened smile on his face as he said, A part of me would like to say it's because she saw me, but that's not true. Despite her nonchalance toward the situation, she was an abomination. Her color of her skin and her supposed sexual orientation had doomed her already. My skin crawled just seeing her walk around every day. It was all just a matter of time. He paused, then continued with, Now, if you're done buying time, sadly, Smith, I can't have you around anymore. I ran for the door at the back, but it was locked. My heart was pounding, and tears began filling my eyes. I turned and watched as he picked a hammer from the shelf before lunging at me. Fighting back was the only option I had, and I had to take it. I grabbed his hands mid-air and we began struggling. He was oddly powerful for an elderly man, and as he hit my nose with his head, I let go of him. I was disoriented for a few seconds, and that's when I felt the hammer hit my head. I immediately hit the floor as I was barely conscious and could feel the pool of blood forming around my head as I closed my eyes. In the distance, I could hear sirens, and the last thing I saw was the manager's feet move past me 
as he unlocked the back door and left. I woke up days later in the hospital and was informed I was almost dead by the time I arrived at the hospital. The manager was identified to be Griffith Theodore, a notorious and wanted leader of the Second Clan white supremacists. It was revealed both Donald and Gerald have supported and aided him for years and were never identified by the authorities. Griffith, Donald, and Gerald had escaped the police and were reported to have already fled the state. The following years after that were difficult. I suffered a traumatic brain injury from the blow to the head and had to undergo therapy and rehabilitation for traumatic brain injury. Burger King ruined my life and there's a shiver that runs down my spine every time I walk past one. I can't help but always wonder if there's a deeper meaning to the restaurant's infamous slogan. Have it your way. When I was a teenager, I had a friend who lived near the forest. Our small town in Colorado had a mountain on one side and a thick forest on the other. Henry and I grew up together. His house was big and built sometime during the 1800s. A full wooden house with a wine cellar and a basement. Once, while playing in his backyard, he stumbled over something and fell. It wasn't a rock, because we always made sure that there were no rocks in the backyard while we played. Cole, see? It looks like a metal box. There, in the middle of the backyard, was a corner of a metal box peeking from the ground. Yeah, let's dig it and see if we find some treasure. We both were very excited to find something as we knew that Henry's house had a history even before his family bought it. We sat on the ground and started digging with our hands, getting the dirt between our nails and on our clothes. We did not care. All we wanted was to find what was inside the box. Finally, after a few hours of digging and completely getting ourselves dirty, we removed the box from the ground. It was an old tin case. Henry, being the more curious of us, shook the box violently against his ear. We could hear something in the box like a piece of glass or something. Unfortunately, we couldn't open the box as it had an old rustic looking lock on it. We should ask your dad to break the lock for us so we can find what's in there, I suggested and we both ran inside with the box in hand. We found Henry's dad sitting in the drawing room watching TV. Why are you boys so dirty? And what is that? We found this box in the backyard while playing and we want you to break the lock so we can see if there's treasure inside, Henry told his father. His dad laughed and took the box from us. He grabbed a small screwdriver and a hammer and broke the lock and then handed us the box. We went to the backyard and opened the box. But before we could take a look at what was inside, Henry said, Whatever we find, we split it 50-50. Agreed? Absolutely. I complied eagerly. Then we opened the box. We were hoping to find a treasure or at least some money or something extremely valuable. But instead, there was a thick piece of paper folded in half and a tear-shaped piece of glass. Looks like it's a map to a hidden treasure, Henry said, too eager to find some long-lost treasure. Let's open it and see what it is, I said. We opened the folded paper, and to our surprise, it was a very old-looking Ouija board. Wow, a Ouija board. What the hell? It's pretty cool. Yeah, not what you expected, but amazing nevertheless. Hey, it's pretty late today, but... Why don't we play with it tomorrow? Sure, I'll be here in the morning and then we can play with it. With that, I went home. The next day I was there before lunch and we went into the basement and laid out the board. Henry's basement was like a storeroom, but a bit cleaner. We often played there when it was raining or snowing outside. There was some furniture there, an old couch, a wooden cupboard that probably belonged to the previous owner some more miscellaneous furniture, and a full-length mirror. We sat in the basement in front of the mirror and started playing. Before that day, we had never seen a real Ouija board, let alone played with one. All we knew was, you are supposed to put your finger on the glass piece and ask questions. So we began. Is there a spirit here with us? I asked. And there was no reply. The glass piece did not move. We would like to connect with any spirit lingering in this house, 
I tried again. But again, there was no reply. Then we tried asking some more questions along the line, but still no response. I don't think there are any spirits here, Henry said, finally frustrated. I think Ouija boards are fake. We both laughed after that. Should we go upstairs for lunch? Nah, let's give it a last try and if this time nothing happened, we will go up. Henry said, okay, if you say so. Is there any spirit or ghost who would like to talk to us? I said in a bored voice. I knew for sure there would be no reply. But suddenly, the glass piece moved and stopped at the word, yes. Did you move it? No, I swear I did not. When we both realized that the glass piece had moved on its own, we exchanged a scared but excited look. Who are you? Henry asked. The glass piece moved around some more and stopped on random letters. When we spelled them out, it gave us a name. Ivan Volkov. It seems like a foreign name, maybe Russian, I said. Are you Russian? Henry asked. The piece again stopped on, yes. Are you trapped here? Again, a yes. Why are you trapped here? This time, the piece moved for a long time. I died here, so I'm stuck here. After every reply we got, we became more and more curious and carefree. The spirit Ivan, whom we had found to be a Russian soldier who had died here, seemed not so harmful. We gathered from our chat that he died in the late 1800s and was buried somewhere in an unmarked grave on Henry's property. He had been here ever since then. Suddenly, Henry's mom called us from upstairs for lunch. We got up and left just like that too eager to have lunch as we were pretty hungry. We ate our lunch while watching cartoons and then returned to the basement. However, when we got down there, nothing was how we had left it except the Ouija board. Everything was falling and some of the old glass pieces were shattered on the floor. I and Henry were confused. The board and the glass piece were completely still untouched. However, when we looked into the mirror, we saw the reflection of the glass piece move and a dead soldier was standing right behind us. We both screamed and ran upstairs. Henry's parents were confused at first, but when we told them what had happened, his dad went downstairs and grabbed the godforsaken game. He put it into the tin box we had found it in, locked it, and the next day buried it somewhere deep into the forest. He believed that the Ouija board was cursed. That's why it was locked and buried in the first place. Also, upon doing some research, we realized that I and Henry just left the game for lunch without saying goodbye or ending our connection with the spirit. After that day, I never played with a Ouija board in my life and steered clear of any such cursed games. Being a single mom of two twin boys is tough, especially if your kids are three-year-old toddlers. They are hyperactive and, and are always in need of supervision. So just to be safe, I installed cameras all around the house. I'm a working mom and I have to make sure the kids are safe in the house with the nanny while I go to work. Being a single mom also means between work, looking after the kids and chores, I hardly get any time to shop for groceries or do anything for myself so I mostly rely on food and grocery delivery services. DoorDash is one of my favorites. They are quick and deliver whenever I need stuff no matter what time it is. Oftentimes I order stuff from DoorDash while I'm at work and the nanny takes the delivery for me. My twin sons, Alex and Adam, love home-cooked food. So I try to make meals from scratch as frequently as possible. They also like to play a lot, so I have a small park in the backyard for them. It has a kiddie pool, slides, a set of swings, and a trampoline. It's a good place to host play dates and small parties for kids as well. Sometimes while I'm at work, I like to watch my kids play in the park through the CCTV camera app. Also, we live in an area where wild animals often visit us, 
So a motion detection alert from the ring camera and the backyard camera helps us to be safe. However, last month, something very scary happened. Every evening I get home by 6, and I spend the rest of my day with my kids, and by 8.30 I make sure they are in bed. Mostly due to all the activities they do throughout the day, they fall asleep after dinner. Then I do chores around the house, clean up behind them, and rarely enjoy a glass of red wine by the fireplace while reading a book. But that day was especially exhausting, because the nanny had left early and I had to rush around the evening traffic to get back home to my kids. I made us dinner and made sure they were asleep. Afterwards, I hardly had any energy to do anything else, so I went to bed. Sometime around 3 a.m., I suddenly woke up. Someone was ringing the bell and knocking on the front door. I was terrified for a second, but then I heard a woman. Please open your door. It's your DoorDash delivery. But I had not ordered anything on DoorDash. Or had I? Sometimes all the work made me forgetful, so I checked my phone, and sure enough, I hadn't ordered anything. And why would I order anything at that ungodly hour? I thought about opening the door and letting the poor delivery girl know that she had the wrong address. That's when I received a notification on my phone. There was motion detected in our backyard, in my kid's play area. I wondered if it was a deer or, God forbid, a bear. Those things would come around once in a while to soak in the kiddie pool. So instead of going out of the house, I checked the live footage on the camera in the backyard and I just sat in my bed, frozen. There were four men in my backyard, right outside my kid's window, trying to break into the house. I was alone with my kids, and I had no firearms with me. Please, open the door. I have other deliveries. I do not have all night. The door dash girl was practically yelling now and banging on the door. Often, if there was no one to pick up the order, the DoorDash delivery person would just leave the stuff by the door, so this woman had no need to be so aggressive. The four men were wearing dark hoodies with hoods pulled up and a mask covering their faces. I couldn't see their faces through the cam, but I was scared shitless. That's when I switched to my ring camera and saw the woman. She might not have spotted my ring camera because she was constantly looking to the left where there is a path leading to my backyard and gesturing for something. It seemed like she was part of the gang as well. But at that moment, my first concern was protecting Alex and Adam. So I got out of bed, padded towards the kitchen, and grabbed a knife. Then, I headed to the kids' bedroom and immediately heard the people trying to break in from outside. Before calling the cops, I had to make sure my kids were safe. Luckily, we had a basement where we could hide till the police arrived in case those people succeeded on breaking in. Hey, Alex, Adam, wake up. We need to play a game. I whispered to my kids, praying the people outside did not hear me. My kids are dead sleepers, so they did not budge. So instead of waking them, I picked up Alex and ran downstairs as fast as I could without making any sound. Then I came back up for Adam, and soon all three of us were in the basement. Both of them were sleeping in two old lawn chairs while I paced the room, trying to call 911. The operator assured me that I had done the right thing and I should shut the basement door and have a weapon in case things went south. No matter the circumstance was I supposed to come up until the cops were at my door. I hung up the phone and then stared at the live footage on the phone. Those people were still trying, but they had no tools so it was tough to open the window or the door. The DoorDash girl was not helping them. I was still praying wishing they did not damage my home or harm me and my kids. A few minutes later, I saw the people argue amongst themselves. Two of them climbed the fence and walked away. 
Three others, including the DoorDash girl, followed once they realized the doors and windows were shut tight. Fifteen minutes later, the cops showed up, and finally, Adam and Alex woke up too. I brought them upstairs and told the cops what happened. I also showed them the footage. According to the footage, it looks like the gang had a plan in place. The DoorDash girl was the first part of the plan. If you opened the door for her, the rest of the four people would have ambushed you and force-entered the house. But when you did not open the door, the people started to find alternative ways into the house. But when they realized the locks were unbreakable, they abandoned the mission and ran away. From the looks of it, these people are novices at this. They may have even been teenagers trying to cause some chaos. Nevertheless, it's best you hid in the basement. You never know what those people wanted. Also, henceforth, be careful. And good thing you invested in a good security system. With that, the cops did a perimeter check and left. Never in my life had I ever been so scared for myself and my kids. But I was happy that we got out of it unscathed.